I live on a 20-acre horse ranch in the panhandle of Florida, about a half hour from the Alabama border. And 15 minutes ago, I heard the strangest animal sound I've ever heard, if it was an animal. It happened almost right outside the property, which is only about 50 feet away from where I am now. It was a very loud whistle. I heard it four times spaced out by like 15 to 30 seconds, and each whistle was different, no repeating tunes or notes. It was loud enough to sound like it was echoing across the property. After the four independent whistled tunes, it was followed by a sound that almost sounded like a frustrated sigh, then nothing. Then the whole thing would start all over again. I sat there listening to this, like somebody was just facing the property outside the fence line, whistling four different tunes, huffing in frustration, and then doing it again. What's even stranger is that it was dead quiet while this was happening. Shortly after the silence, I could hear a pack of coyotes in the distance, which happens all the time. The owls over the lake, which is also frequent. But while this was happening, I didn't hear any of that. Also, to be clear, where the sound was coming from is an open field. It's so dark I can't see my hand in front of my face when I go out there. The weirdest thing is, we're more likely to hear gunshots than other people out here. The closest neighbors are like a half mile away in the other direction. This sound came from the road side of the property. The closest neighbors in that direction are over a mile away. We also have two donkeys on the property to ward off predators, and I didn't hear either of them warning the herd, which would mean that maybe it was a human I was hearing. But like I said, the property is fenced and gated, so they would have had to hop the fence. And whistling is a really weird thing to do when you're trespassing in an area where shooting is common. Update. It's now 30 minutes after the initial thing happened. I hear the horses running fast away from where the sound originated. Then, about a minute later, I hear their hooves heading back to where the sound originated. This happened several times. I am really confused. Something happened when I was camping 20 years ago, and I can't get it out of my head. If you have any ideas about what this might be, I'm very interested in hearing it. I was visiting my uncle and cousin, Sarah, in rural Pennsylvania. I was about 16, and Sarah was about 12. Sarah asked me if we could go camping, which meant pitching a tent at the top of this huge foothill that was on the property. The foothill was very steep and had woods at the top. I'd never been camping before then, but I figured if anything happened, we could just walk back down to the house. So I said, cool, no problem. We pitched the tent so the woods were directly behind it, with the tent opening facing out toward the scenery and the view. We roasted marshmallows, told campfire stories, and got in the tent around 11 p.m. or midnight. Sarah fell asleep right away but I couldn't, so I was just lying there counting sheep. Suddenly, I heard leaves shuffling in the woods behind the tent, and I heard footsteps coming out of the woods behind the tent. There were a few steps, and then it would stop. Then a few more, and as it got closer, I heard it step on some large rocks. It sounded like a really large hoof stepped on the rock, because it made that same clop sound as a horse. As it got closer to the tent, I could feel the impact of each step in the ground under me, so whatever it was sounded very heavy. 
At first I thought it was a large buck and I debated waking up my cousin so she wouldn't miss it. But then it kept coming closer to the tent, closer than a deer or buck ever would have. And suddenly I was overcome with this feeling of full body dread, like something was very, very wrong. Then I heard a really bizarre sound. It sounded like it was coming from about eight to 10 feet off the ground. And the best way I can describe it is like someone had a huge roll of masking tape and was pulling off a big section at a time. It was this odd tearing sound for lack of a better word. And each tearing sound was loud and lasted two to three seconds. I told myself that it was a deer and that it was tearing bark off trees and that's what was making the noise. But deep down, I knew something was wrong. I didn't want to risk waking or scaring Sarah. So I just lay there as quietly as possible, praying that whatever it was would leave. But instead of leaving, the tearing sound got closer, still about eight to 10 feet off the ground. Now it was directly behind the tent, within five to 10 feet. Right then I heard Sarah scream whisper my name and I realized she was awake and heard it too. She asked me what it was and I told her that it was fine, that it was just a deer and to go back to sleep. She said, that doesn't sound like a deer. But I insisted that it was because I was too scared to make a run for the house with whatever this thing was right outside. So we listened to it slowly move around to the left side of the tent, still close, still making the sound every few seconds. And then things got even weirder. It started moving around to the front of the tent where the ground dropped off steeply. So each few feet forward was also several feet down. As this thing went around to the front, the sound stayed at the eight to 10 foot height and was slowly moving to the right. Now, if the thing making this sound was standing on the ground, then the sound should have dropped several feet, but the sound stayed at the same height all the way around. I even wondered if it was a bird, but it was moving too slowly and that wouldn't account for the hoof steps I'd heard before. After the sound faded into the woods, Sarah and I just lay awake for the rest of the night, too afraid to leave the tent. At first light, we booked it back to the house and told my uncle what had happened. Even though he didn't know what it was, he just shrugged and didn't seem too concerned. But that experience scared me so much I've never been camping since, since I know I didn't hallucinate or imagine it because Sarah heard it too. Has anyone else ever heard of anything like this? I've asked friends who are avid outdoorsmen, hunters and trackers, and none of them have ever heard of anything like it. One night in the spur of the moment, my best friend, my girlfriend and I went camping on the banks of a creek that I lived within five miles of. We grabbed a 20 pack of beer, some blankets and some cigarettes and headed out in my piece of shit van with good spirits. It was about a week to 10 days before Halloween, so it got dark on us pretty quickly. We made haste and gathered firewood with flashlights, ignited a fire, which rapidly grew hot and threw off a lot of light, which allowed us to gather enough wood to chill and drink a couple of beers. We broke out the boom box and commenced having a good time. A few hours went by very quickly and my girlfriend went to the van to sleep, although I don't know how, as it was pretty cold away from the fire. Anyway, my friend's girlfriend got off work at midnight and brought us more beer, though we didn't need it, as we had only drank about half of what we had initially brought. Those two got in an argument and she left. We watched as her taillights faded into the night. Then the weird stuff started happening. This place wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was secluded, but we could see farmhouses from where we were. It was far enough tucked out and cold enough where nobody would be screwing around anywhere near us. All of a sudden, my buddy goes, screw that woman and turns up the radio as loud as it would go, but not for long. It was about that time that I heard what he was talking about. 
A distinct woman's voice from across the creek scream in a guttural way, help me. I looked across the fire at my buddy to see him look as pale and sheepish as I felt. He turned down the radio before I could say anything. Dude, did you hear that? He said. He grabbed his cell phone and we both grabbed flashlights and shined them across the creek. He called his girlfriend to make sure she didn't have car trouble down the road. She was already home. That was like a relief and more stress at the same time. It wasn't her, so who the hell could it be? We stood there in the grip of fear. Lights shined across the water. We didn't hear anything for what seemed like forever. Just when we were about to chalk it up to imagination or jitters or something, we hear, help me. A woman that couldn't have been a hundred yards away from where we were standing, which was right on the opposite bank of the creek from where we were. We quickly shone our lights to where the plea for help was coming from, but there was nothing there. We both called out, hello, where are you? Hello? No response ever came. Being experienced in the outdoors, we both knew that if she was being attacked or chased, there would be other noises we could hear, like rustling in the fallen leaves, or as close as it sounded, some more cries for help or twigs snapping or something. By this time, whatever buzz we had from the beer was long gone. We began gathering whatever we could grab and I woke up my girlfriend and commanded her to start the van and that we were leaving. She promptly did this and it's probably a good thing that she did because what came next still scares me to this day and is completely unexplainable. As we were piling in, we hear, help me, come from the very back of the van, which was in the complete opposite direction of where the screams had been coming from. Needless to say, we left the beer and radio and got out of Dodge. I had my girlfriend get out of the way and I burned out, nearly wrecking the car in the process. I drove the dirt road about 60 all the way out. This happened in October of 2002 and I can't reconcile what it was. I tried saying that it was maybe coyotes or foxes. They make a yipping bark and a really scary scream respectively. There aren't any mountain lions within 500 miles of this place, so it wasn't that either. But whatever it was spoke, and to my knowledge, none of those things do. Whatever it was, it scared two 21-year-olds into leaving a case of beer behind. Honestly, I don't think I want to know what it was. Although, I think I have a pretty good idea. I was out walking the woods at an ungodly hour of the morning. I believe it was around one to two in the morning. Last year, I was working at a church youth camp in Wisconsin. The camp was on two sides of a highway and a tunnel under the highway connected the two sides of the camp so that the campers could more readily access the other side. My then girlfriend and our friend liked to walk the woods at night after we were done with work. The first time we had done this, we were scared shitless by a fox barking. The deer in the woods were fairly docile and didn't spook easily. We soon learned to identify the sound of the fox, and we saw it several times. One night, it was just me and my ex-girlfriend walking through the woods. As we rounded a corner in the trail, I noticed movement in the field by the tunnel. Gray shapes. I assumed they were deer, and I pointed them out to my girlfriend. We continued our walk past the tunnel. Just as we passed the entrance to the tunnel, maybe about 20 yards, we heard the most horrendous screeching. It sounded as if somebody was being strangled. It did not sound at all like the fox, but we shrugged it off. We continued up the road. All of a sudden, I had this weird feeling, and I turned around to see a tall figure standing in the road. It was dressed in white and it was all hazy. I wondered if I was a little too tired and was seeing things, so I poked my girlfriend and asked her to take a look behind us. She immediately noticed it too. Something we both noted was that our eyes kept sliding off the figure. It was like we couldn't keep our vision centered on it. I was thinking this and she voiced it without me saying anything to her. 
I pulled my hunting knife from its sheath, but I somehow knew that it wouldn't do anything. Without looking away from the thing, I said, let's go, now. We backed away and then started running, and we didn't stop until we were back to the cabins. When I got back inside the cabin, the guy in the bunk next to me was still up texting his girlfriend. I quickly told him what I had seen. He looked at me and said, that's why I don't go out at night. I never went back out into those woods at night again. And when I talk about this, I still get chills and a nervous feeling. We had no drugs or alcohol. We were both under 21 and we were working at a church camp with strict policies. So I have no idea what we saw. When I, was, when I was around five, I went camping with my parents in a place called Bear Creek Reservoir in BC. It's a very isolated place, deep in the woods. We got there by driving up an old logging road. The actual reservoir itself was very beautiful and quiet. I actually looked up the area on Google Maps and it still gives me chills, even looking at it from a satellite perspective. But anyway, the day passed by without incident, and we mostly just swam the whole day. We went to bed that night and nothing unusual had happened. But the following morning, I woke up in my parents' tent just as the sun was making its appearance. I unzipped the tent and noticed a figure standing maybe 50 feet away. The light was still fairly dim, so it was hard to make out distinct details, but it was just standing there, staring at me, unmoving. The entity had the figure of a woman of average size, but instead of seeing a face, there was just darkness. Even so, I could tell that it was looking at me. And instead of clothes and skin, it had leaves and sticks, as if it was made from them. I remember feeling very afraid of this creature, like if I left the tent, I wouldn't be seen again kind of fear. So I tried waking up my parents, and they were both really pissed that I woke them up and they didn't believe me at all, until they finally got up later and explored the area. We ended up finding a bunch of man-made structures made of branches and other weird stuff in the area, but not one where I had seen it, so I don't know. Anyway, that's my true story. Let me know what you think. I'd like to go there again someday and see if I can find anything, but maybe it's best I don't. When I was in northern Nova Scotia this last year while camping and fishing, I saw these odd shadow figures in the treetops. Everything was proportional about them, except for their arms. They were just way too long. They appeared just after dusk and they never came near to the ground. They didn't necessarily feel malicious. It just felt bad like I shouldn't do anything that could draw their attention or else it would have gone badly. Nothing of note happened other than them being there, but I'd never heard of anything like it before. Is anyone aware of any legends or anything describing shadow figures and treetops? I'd love to even have a name for these things because to this day, I still have no idea what I saw. About two years ago, my husband and I took our five kids to a water theme park in Idaho. We live in Washington State. We borrowed my dad's trailer and truck and thought it would be less expensive and more fun if we camped at a campground down the road rather than the one made for the park. I've driven through Idaho before and so has my husband, but we've never stayed there before. To preface my experience, I have had nightmares on occasion where I felt like something was trying to possess me. 
I always end up reciting the Lord's Prayer or yelling or something. I'll be honest, sometimes it takes a couple of tries and I always have my husband wake me up because I'm screaming. I regularly pray for protection, wear protective crystals, and ask my guardians for protection also. I feel as though because I regularly research and read into the paranormal, it's best to take precautions. So here we are at this campground. The first night, everything was great. Nothing happened. The next day, we take the kids to the park, spend all day there, and come back to cook dinner and get ready for bed. I also must say, while I have read a lot about sleep paralysis, I have never experienced it until this night, and I have not since. Once we were all in bed, I started to fall asleep. While asleep, I feel awake. I can see the trailer around me in kind of what felt like a blur, but I'm unable to shout or scream or move. I look to the end of my bed and see what looks like a short, four foot tall or so demon-like thing. It has horns and it's difficult to make out its face and it's terrifying. All of a sudden, I feel my husband grab my arm and I'm awake. He says, you were screaming, are you okay? I told him I was fine and tried to go back to sleep, but the same thing happened again, except this time the demon was closer to me. I remember shouting in my head, Jesus is my savior, go away, but he wouldn't. I remember trying to scream for my husband, but I couldn't. Then once again, my husband grabs my arm and wakes me up, saying I'm still screaming. At this point, I still told him I was fine. I attempted to sleep once more and the same thing happened again and again and every time the demon thing was even closer. No matter what I tried, he wouldn't leave and again my husband would wake me up. Eventually I told him what was going on. He said he was sorry. This time I didn't try to fall back asleep. I wrapped as much of him as I could around me and desperately tried not to sleep. I felt like something was trying to pull me towards sleep, but I fought it. Next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and told my husband the entire story. I have never researched the area. I can't remember the name of the campground. Because I was so terrified, I haven't really shared this story until recently. This happened at a school camp when I was about 11 years old. Our school camp was scheduled to be at a campground about two and a half to three hours away. I remember talking to people about the camp and where I was going, and one of my friends who was a year older told me that they saw something like a pair of eyes when they were down at the creek one night. Skip ahead, I can't exactly remember what night this was of the five day camp, but I remember exactly what happened and I always will. We were sitting with the other students and we had just finished eating, meaning it was time to play games and to calm all the kids down. My friend Savannah told me that she needed to go down to our tent and change clothes and asked if I would come with her. I said that I would and one of the teachers said that I could go with her. Keep in mind the tents were way away from the rest of camp and it was actually a walk to get to them as it was a huge campground. So we got a torch and walked down to the tents. We got in and left our tent window open for light as it would have been awkward to have the torch on. Stupid, I know, but we were young. We turned around and I started changing too. Then something very bright caught my attention. I looked at the window and there were flashing bright lights everywhere and I swear there was no way it could have been a camera because there were tons at the window moving so fast. I quickly spun around and in like one second, they were at the door, then vanished. I quickly said to my friend, what was that? And we totally freaked out. We quickly finished getting changed and hurried back to our class and teachers where the teacher had just talked to the class we had to explain what happened to the teachers. It seems like just a sicko taking photos when you hear the story, 
but I promise that I know it wasn't a camera. You can take my word for that. There was no way, and I've been around cameras modeling and stuff, so I know what all the camera flashes are like. I don't know what I saw that night, and I don't think I ever will, but I know that I will remember that night for the rest of my life. This is my story of a dude I happened to come across in the deep woods in Florida. This was in Ocala National Forest. I probably came across either a poacher's camp or a drug operation, and they put signs up to scare people away. In any case, my friend and I were hunting and stayed out past midnight looking for hogs. We realized we were way deeper into the woods than we had planned on being, and we began to walk out. We were probably three or four miles into the woods, off the main road. We were walking in the dark, heavily armed with AR-15s, sidearms, and fixed blade hunting knives in a hip sheath. So we really weren't afraid of anything. Plus, the moon was bright enough to navigate by, even under the trees. We had lights mounted on our rifles, and I had a large, powerful flashlight in my hand that I could make into a strobe or use as a club. The point is, we weren't paranoid of anything. We felt very prepared. We were heading back and we started to hear something hauling through the woods on our right. It was about to cross the trail in front of us. Most trails are old logging roads. They're pretty wide and they make square quadrants out of the forest. This particular trail cut across one of the quadrants and was overgrown and thin. We thought it was a deer or maybe a black bear. Either way, we couldn't shoot it at night. So instead of using the rifle lights, I used my handheld light. We waited until we heard it get near the trail, and then I turned my light on. All we saw was a pair of white legs cross the thin trail about 50 feet in front of us. They looked human. We were a little baffled, like what moron goes crashing through the deep woods at 1 a.m. in shorts and through the thick brush, not the trail. Super weird, but again, and armed as we were for hogs, we pushed on because it would have taken like 30 minutes extra to turn back and go around the quadrant. We hear crashing now and then in the woods, but it never got close to us again. Finally, we reached my car and I was relieved that it was still there and not broken into. We keep the rifles loaded, shove our handguns between the seat and the center console and get into the front seat. I began to drive out of the forest with my moonroof open, and the stars were just gorgeous. It's easy to forget how amazing the night sky is in the middle of Ocala. About half a mile down the road, my headlights fall onto a man in a checkered button-down shirt and shorts, just walking along the road. We're miles from any paved road, and then it's another five to ten miles on the paved road to get to a town. Also, this is in the northern part of the forest, where there are no old cabins that were built before it was declared a national park. This dude had no backpack or anything. Was this what we saw across the path? If so, what was he doing walking out here at 1.32 in the morning with no supplies, no flashlight, nothing? He didn't even look at us as we passed. Anyway, as we got near the paved road, we unloaded the rifles and put them in the trunk and went home. It was a really fun trip, and I can't wait to go back, but I will always be armed in Ocala. Something seriously weird is going on out there. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. 
My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt, large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet as he was behind me. So I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up. And at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later, though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. 
Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly, who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick, and the bear ran off. All I could think was, just my luck. But that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. 
I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose, an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of Western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now. These are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual, but it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just 
weird. But I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool, and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again, 
We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts, who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders. Instead, opting to flank around deep into the woods, which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me, but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them. So I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay. But upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off. But there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform, think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not. 
but it's still kind of strange. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory we made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks and since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20-something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb, I come along, thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn, so we get there at around 11 p.m. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much, so our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river, into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchanged nervous looks, and suddenly, 
we hear crunching coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked, along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost... I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating? Undulating? I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles. Just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian, and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it, because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around, and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips. She nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile. While slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes. Except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually, we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old-looking, smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs her smiling face undulating from the shadows. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park it's an extremely rural area with a tiny Western town about a mile away. And that's about it for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon and it was now around 11 PM. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, Eastern Washington as a whole is pretty desolate so the night sky is generally incredible, with very little light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park, above the campground, with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we're both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills and we noticed this odd concentration of light on one hillside, 
about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. We still have no explanation for what we witnessed. I was on patrol one night in my town, and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it's pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact, and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road, which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it, and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're no strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere, seeing as there's a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel, and two men had gone into the room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So, we're sent out there and being guided over radio by dispatch. When we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps, and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe about nine, were standing outside the motel. Most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly to talk to the people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of all the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser, and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, something like that. As soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful to the ears and caused us to run to the room from which it was coming. We yelled in that we were the police and we went in. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops, just gone. The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls. No blood though, nothing seems to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean, no scratches. Closets were empty. We looked under the beds even, and nothing was there. We poked around for as long as we felt was necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out and help. We left and went back to the station and wrote up written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea, and we haven't heard anything from the lake town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratching on the walls and footsteps, as well as nightmares. None of this happened until we went there. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, currently trying Ambien to see if it'll keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on our vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. I have no idea what this might have been. I'm leaning towards some kind of elaborate prank, but it just seems odd. Like, it would have taken way too much effort to actually fake it to be worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the so-called gas station coming to our gas stations and filling up gas cans. He puts them in the back of his pickup and drives back toward the highway with him. I also asked around as the post office said that they do occasionally get mail to and from there, but it's mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps, the view is blocked by trees on Google Earth, and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway. I've been having trouble finding really any official records related to it, aside from a case file from the early 90s, before I was even born. 
about a textbook domestic disturbance. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. And I mean, there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours and around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield. I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course you're gonna feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in, but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen and I love being scared. Anyway, I started making my way toward the barn. Getting closer and closer, I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington jokingly saying that I saw something and I was gonna go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. Behind the barn, but sort of to the side, like how when someone peers from a corner. At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner, and I didn't do either of those things. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body. And somehow, my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw. But he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her, and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes, but I know it was real. I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner 
was very tall, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad, but if any of you have a clue of what I might have seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and windigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I want to know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with the job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was about to find a body. Holding on to a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it had been when I first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. An empty tunnel stretched the width of the highway Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside, just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell engulfed me even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, 
I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away, farther into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was all right. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking, and I walked briskly to my car as they drove away. I got the hell out of there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned, yes. This guy is the son of a missionary and has been all around the world. He has seen, rather smelled, this before and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Maybe something else happened. Maybe there's some shred of a possibility that there's a scientific explanation. But honestly, I think I agree with my friend. I think there's a demon in the valley. I've lived in rural Massachusetts for 17 years of my life, and I've encountered a lot of wildlife in my time here. One day I was moving my mare up toward another pasture, which was a little ways down from my house, a good 15 minute walk. I tacked her up and we were making our way down the main road. The road is still very rural, dense forest lies on either side, and cars rarely drive on it. It's a perfect main road to horseback ride on. All of a sudden, my mare wouldn't keep going. Annoyed, I dismounted and decided to lead her on foot to the pasture. We were making our way around a corner when I noticed my mare's gaze fixated on something. Less than 15 feet away from us was a large black bear. As we made eye contact, my heart sank into my stomach. I was 16 years old at the time and barely weighed 100 pounds. Staring down something so large is unforgettable and it was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. Not only do I have this thing's attention, but I have a whole damn horse with me, and I'm on the ground, not even on the horse. Maybe I didn't act the way I was supposed to, but I'm alive, so I'm not complaining. I slowly started walking backwards with my mare, not wanting to risk anything. Adrenaline does weird things. After I re-rounded the corner and the bear was out of sight, I mounted my mare and made my way back to my house. I actually drove up with my car and managed to get a few blurry pictures of it, but nothing to write home about. I have had a lot of weird ass borderline paranormal encounters in the woods, but nothing beats mother nature's creatures. I lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there in the U.S. Army. We lived off base in private housing and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns, everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests running around and exploring fishing, playing army, stuff like that. I was around eight or nine years old at that time, and I'm over 40 now. One night, I stayed late at the farm hanging out with the guys. I left at about nine or 10-ish. It was dark, but the moonlight gave pretty good vision. I lived just across the soccer field and then across a small cornfield from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement just really quickly, out of the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. 
I quickly stepped up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least a half a dozen silhouettes emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze. They just stood there. And then all of a sudden, there's one standing behind me. Before I can snap around and get out of there, he asks in German where I'm going. I turned around and what I see surprises but also relieves me. I answered in English and told him I was headed home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out so much in tactical gear, I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons, there was even a dog. They looked like total badasses. Apparently they were using these small towns to do some off-base training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I will never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put and I would have walked right by them none the wiser. But they all walked me home as it was on their way back. It started off super creepy, but it was actually pretty cool. And it's an experience that I will never forget. I've been dying to get this story off my chest for years to people who don't think I'm crazy, as it's rather maddening. Before I begin, I don't believe in things like Bigfoot, werewolves, ghosts, supernatural or paranormal stuff in general, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to explain what happened this night. This was a long time ago. I was a teenager. My parents were not very strict, so I had a lot of freedom. I had two friends, and they had their own friends as well. And one of my friend's parents owned this huge part of a forest. My friends, their friends, and I went deep into the woods with a bunch of supplies, and we started making our own treehouse and forts. It was a big part of my childhood, building stuff with my friends, and this place became our sanctuary for a long time, where we'd spend a lot of our time away from the adults. This event happened years after we built the place initially, and also after we rebuilt it because one time it got destroyed. But that's another interesting story for a different time. This is the backstory for all of the events that I'm about to recall. One friend and I spent the night at our sanctuary that we had built, which none of us have ever done before. We only hung out there and then went home. We all planned to spend the night together because it would be fun. Most of our friends weren't allowed to spend the night there though because of parents and other things, and one chickened out because he was afraid. So it ended up just being me and one other person, my close friend's cousin. We weren't really close at the time and we fought a lot, but surprisingly we got along well that night. We spent most of the day swinging from trees, climbing them and hanging out on this tire rope swing while talking. It was a normal day, and then we laid down for rest at about 9 p.m. About 10 minutes after laying down in bed in our sleeping bags, talking to each other under our makeshift tents, we heard rustling. I sat up and saw a very tall silhouette of something that looked to be like a human but was transparent. I could see right through it. I squinted and froze, and it very quickly climbed this tall tree and as I was looking at it, it disappeared. I was in complete disbelief and shock. I had no idea what I had just seen, if I had seen it at all or if I had hallucinated. I wasn't scared in the moment, just perplexed. Being young and worried though, I said to my friend that we should leave and not wanting it to hear me, I got close to his ear and just said, there's something in the woods looking at us. After I said that, I saw his facial expression turn to fear, so we got up and started walking down the path out of the woods, calmly. I didn't want to sprint because it might chase, and I also wasn't even sure I'd seen anything. I just didn't want to take any chances. 
Very shortly after we left, we both got this weird feeling of deja vu and confusion, like we'd been hit with hard drugs or something, except we don't do drugs, and we had only eaten food that we brought from our house. There are also no hallucinogenic plants in our part of the country. Nothing like that. Everything was so slow, and I felt disoriented. But we continued to walk in this direction for quite a while, stumbling in the darkness because of our mental state. I realized that we should have been out of the forest by now. I knew that this was the way out, 110%, because I'd been going in and out of this place for years, even in the dark. Yet, I didn't recognize all the trees around us, just the path. It was like our surroundings were changing. My friend randomly yells, Yeah, I'm coming, as I'm looking in the opposite direction from him. I turned around, very confused, and asked him why he said that. He said that his mom was calling his name to help lead him out of the forest. I heard nothing. I told him that I didn't hear anything, and he looked at me like I was insane and walked off the path and into the forest. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back, because I didn't want him to get lost. That's when my friend sees the transparent thing that I saw earlier, sitting perched on a tree branch in the direction that his mom was calling him from. He points it out to me. Its transparency is almost like a heat wave effect. We stared at it for 10 seconds in total disbelief. It looked like a transparent being, but we were trying to discern if it was something else and we were just imagining it being alive, because there was no movement. But then, it hunched down like it was trying to stalk or be stealthy, and very quickly, it climbed up a tree a little more, and then went to the next one, and then the next one, getting closer to us. We can't hear it at all. It's completely silent, and its silence was exacerbated by the fact that all the other creatures had also gone completely silent, and it was only in that moment that I had really started to realize that. Not a single bug or animal had made a sound since we started leaving camp. This is when our curiosity turned into fear, and once again, we began to see it move. Once it got above us, though, the only thing we could hear was the crunching of the branch as its weight was put down on it. Every little sound that was made was so distinct because it was so quiet and remote. We couldn't see anything because the tops of the trees are so dark. We actually started running, terrified, not worrying about being calm anymore. We heard noises in the trees above us and finally it faded away ahead of us as if it had gone ahead, but the sound was a lot quieter than if a normal animal had been running through the treetops. It sounded as if this thing was very light, but it wasn't very small, so that made no sense. We still kept running forward, despite it sounding like it had gone ahead, and we ended up back at the place that we started. Many, many minutes of walking, and we were back at this place after running for like 20 seconds. It was impossible. But instead of staying on the ground, we climbed to the top of the treehouse with our items as quickly as possible and closed the door, wedging a small piece of plywood on it to keep it shut. We heard something climbing up, and extremely odd noises as well, almost like the mimicking noises of rain and wind, but there was no water seeping into our treehouse, and there would have been had it been raining, and it wasn't wet. This persisted for about a minute, and then we didn't hear from it again. I'm pretty sure at that point it had left but we spent the rest of the night there until the sun came up anyway, just in case. When he checked his iPod touch for the first time, right after we closed the door, it was 5 a.m. We started laying on the ground at 9 p.m. Eight hours had passed in what felt to us like no more than 40 minutes of time. Hours after we could start to see the sun through the treehouse slats, we went home. I no longer talked to this friend, but after this incident, we discussed it, and we told everything from both of our points of view, and it all jived. We randomly brought it up to each other every few months and relived it, making sure that we were still on the same page about what happened and that we both remembered. I never spent the night out there again, and I didn't really even let myself stay out there past 5 p.m. for a very long time.
About three years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, now ex, as she had always expressed interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go-to trail and camp spot as it's hidden deep in the forest and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs and things like that. My family has been going to this spot for about six years and my friends introduced me about 10 years ago. We went on a weekend trip and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people hanging out next to our campsite. Still, they were just stargazing and ended up leaving, so it was weird, but not spooky at all. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended and got very high pitched and sounded as if it just kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. That's when the laugh noise moved up higher and then started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped and then it started again around 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out. So I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something around the campsite. But I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This went on until 6 a.m. when it finally stopped. And that was finally when we could get some rest. After waking up, we checked the campsite and saw nothing unusual, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I started my vehicle, which was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery, and I made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I got a jump from AAA, that phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but in the end, we both laughed, and we did get some help. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite, and also has a cabin in the same forest, about 25 miles away from the campsite, about what had happened, and he got really freaked out. He told me about two incidents that he's had, one at the campsite, and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night, after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance, and he saw a pair of eyes up in the trees, looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother and they were both just chilling by the fire outside when they saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that led into the woods. They stated that at the height the eyes were looking at them, whatever it was had to be over seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles and the eyes disappeared. But once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back in the cabin and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all felt very scared when these events happened. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thought that it might have been a Wendigo. I don't know what it could have been, but I haven't felt that scared before or since. This happened a few years ago, 
I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends. I don't remember all the specifics of why they went out, but that's not really important. My point is, I was all alone in our cabin, playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room, on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that suddenly I got really cold, so I went to go get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow from my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much about it at the time, because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me, because I really don't like being home alone in general, and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had forgotten all about the strange shadow, until I saw it again but this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I was a little creeped out about it now since I was the only one in the cabin. I decided to lock the door to my room just in case. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister who was about three years old at the time she used to cry a lot, so I asked out loud, What's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt, shorts, and my dad's slippers. It was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still, and I got the feeling that it was staring at me, even though I couldn't make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I honestly don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I do remember, though, is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to go back into that one. Ever since that day, I have refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day at the cabin can only be described as unwanted. Like someone or something wanted to harm me, was trying to lure me. I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing even today. It haunts my dreams, and I'm in no rush to see it again. When I was 15 or so, a group of my friends and I all slept over at the leader of our friend group's house. This guy lived in the most absolutely rural area of our rural town, basically in the middle of the woods, a house just surrounded by thick walls of trees. In the evening, we decided to go out and start a bonfire deep in the woods, so we packed up got all of our materials and went straight out there. On the way to the spot that we'd be making our campfire at, he told us about how messed up and creepy his woods are and the numerous things he's seen. White skinny figures peeking around the shed, staring at him and running off when he looked at it, screaming and whispers from the woods, figures watching him, all that good stuff. It set the mood pretty well. By around seven o'clock that night, we had the campfire set up and it was pitch black outside. 
as it was the middle of winter in New Hampshire. I can still remember how creepy the whole vibe was that night. You couldn't see a single thing besides the ring of light coming from the fire. Everything else was just a black wall of nothingness, and the sound of the forest was so quiet that the silence was almost deafening. At least it was if we weren't talking. We ended up needing more firewood and a few other things that we were using for the campfire, so the leader took me to go with him to get it. Without a flashlight or any light source, he and I walked the mile and a half long trail back to his house in complete and utter darkness. It was all good, we were talking, joking with each other, having a good time and just hanging out when the first noises started. He immediately made me stop talking. To my left and my right were a bunch of different sounds, screaming, laughing, talking and whispering, shouting, people saying unintelligible words. It sounded like there was something around 20 people just surrounding us. The natural night vision had finally set in a decent amount and I looked over at my friend who had his head down and didn't say a single word. Known for being a complete goofball and a wild, funny dude, I had never seen him look so shaken and serious in my life. He had this look to him that still kind of haunts me to this day as I knew him pretty well and he always portrayed himself as the fearless leader type. Seeing him so shaken up and afraid was very unsettling. I started to say something along the lines of, what the heck is that? Before he cut me off and told me to be quiet, face forward, and not to pay attention to any of the sounds. I did what he said, and the next three minutes or so were incredibly uncomfortable and terrifying. I remember feeling sick to my stomach. By the time we reached his house, the sounds had stopped. We both grabbed what we needed in total silence. That's when I could really listen to the sheer quietness of that night. No birds, no sticks falling, not a single sound, absurdly silent. We walked back to the campsite and nothing else occurred that night. It's still my most unsettling and bizarre experience that I have no explanation for and I'll never forget it. My friend and I camped on his property in the middle of nowhere. It was in the area of Cane Creek, Kentucky, near Laurel Lake. There was no service no noise, no anything but you and the woods. We set up our tent under an overhang and I was tasked with gathering the firewood. It was about 5 p.m. or so and while collecting, I got this odd feeling and then I started to hear whispers. They weren't saying anything I could make out. It was just murmurings. At that point, I got this creepy, odd feeling and I moved closer to our camp to collect the firewood. I didn't want to stray very far after that. Night progresses and nothing out of the ordinary happens until we climb into our sleeping bags. I heard footsteps in the leaves and more murmuring. I was getting really freaked out, but I know the best thing to do is to ignore it and sleep. And so I did. The following morning, my friend and I found ourselves awake at 5 a.m. He asked me if I had heard whispering last night. I told him I heard it twice, and we were both just as baffled as the other. We were not the first people to camp in this area. His uncle and his friends attempted to camp there as well, but they couldn't make it through the night either. My dad is a hunter, and he refuses to go down there to hunt anymore as well as another friend I have. His dad says that the air down there is rich in death. 
I don't know the reason for what happens down there, but I won't be going back. Back in the summer of 2020, I was traveling with my partner to Boise, Idaho from Colorado to visit his family and stay for a camping trip. This trek is nearly 15 hours long, and while you can do it in a day, it's better if you stop to rest. Having lived in Utah at one point in time, I was very eager to show him the natural hot springs in Spanish Fork. They're located deep in Diamond Fork Canyon and require a 45 minute hike from the parking lot. Still, we were both excited to get out and get moving after seven hours in the car. When we arrived at the first parking lot, however, the gate was shut and locked tight. A sign taped to the metal read, closed, absolutely no access to hot springs, fines $2,000 max or something to that effect. We were bummed. The virus had shut down many things, and we figured that this was outside, so there's no way they were going to close it. After some research on the government website, we discovered that a body had possibly been found in the hot springs, and was likely the cause for the locked gate. Sad and tired of sitting in the car, we drove back down the canyon road to find a spot to camp for the night. Most of the more established campsites were closed due to the virus or were already taken for the night. This was fine since we prefer more dispersed camping anyway. So we picked a random road to turn on as we drove closer to exiting the canyon. Road 338. Most of the road was a well-kept dirt road. We passed some promising spots near a creek and maybe two or three other people were already set up for the night. We wanted to go a little farther to see if there was anything with that wow factor. Sounds funny, but some sites just give off that this is the one feeling. Finally, we came to a dead end in the main road with a fire mitigation road to the right. At this very spot, there was a strange boulder with some type of inscription on it. I had to investigate. The inscription read, Diamond Battle. June 20th, 1866. No way. A memorial for a battle that happened right here. A feeling of uneasiness and oddly respect washed over me. After traveling up the fire road and not finding what we were hoping for in a campsite, we decided to pick a spot by the small creek we passed on the way in. It was getting dark quickly but we set up our tent in no time at all and got a fire going. The creek was loud, but peaceful. Though, ever since I read that inscription, I couldn't shake this strange feeling. I'm not a paranoid person, but I kept feeling on the edge of my seat, like something was watching us from the woods just across the water. As the night grew darker, this feeling grew stronger. I decided I didn't want to be in the open anymore, and I retreated to the tent to get some rest while my partner stayed up to enjoy the fire. I snuggled into our sleeping bag and exhaled comfortably, listening to the creek that was now much quieter and was a bit farther from the tent. I started to drift off when I heard it. Soft chanting, rhythmic drums. My eyes shot open. Was I really hearing that? I strained my ears to listen over the running water. I couldn't quite get a clear sound, but it was definitely there. This is when I noticed that the ground was also rumbling, as if horses were stampeding down the road a hundred feet from our site. I didn't know if I should get out to tell my partner or not, but I had the strange feeling that if I said it out loud, it would make it more true and that an army of spirits would spring from the trees and into our campsite or something. Before I could make the decision, I was dead asleep. This was somehow the most peaceful slumber I had ever had. 
The next morning, we packed up our tent and left no trace that we had ever spent the night by Little Diamond Creek. When I finally entered cell service, I did a Google search of that memorial and Diamond Fork, Utah. It turns out there was a battle there between the Utes and the Mormon militia, and lives were lost on that mountainside. After reading this, I decided to tell my partner what I heard last night before falling asleep. I told him about the chanting and the drumming and even the stomping of horses. He looked at me in total disbelief and said, I heard the same thing. I guess I was only in the tent for about 10 minutes before he got spooked, standing alone by the fire, hearing this distant chanting and drums. He came into the tent and experienced that same peaceful sleep that I had. I feel as though we were being watched over by some of the Native Americans that lost their lives there. A strong but calm and protective presence was there. If you're ever on Diamond Fork Road, I hope you visit and pay respects to the memorial of the diamond battle. And maybe the spirits of the land will watch over you too. Sleigh Bells Ring by J.R. Our eerie encounter in the Smoky Mountains started as a group camping trip aimed at exploring the natural beauty and rugged terrain of one of America's most beloved national parks. But what we experienced over those few nights has left each of us questioning the reality of the wilderness that surrounds us. Our group, five in total, set up camp in a secluded area surrounded by dense forests and a clear view of the starry sky. The first day was an adventure, filled with hiking and sightseeing and everything we had gone there for. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire, shared some stories, and were pretty much just enjoying the peaceful ambiance of the mountains. Then we started to hear a noise. We all kind of sat up and looked around, trying to figure out what it was. It was ringing, like the sound of small bells echoing throughout the forest. It was faint but distinct, encircling our campsite. It was kind of close to Christmas, and so we kind of joked about it, making up stories of Santa or forest fairies or lost hikers with jingle bells. But as the ringing continued, a sense of unease settled over us. Eventually, we shrugged it off as a quirk of the forest. Maybe somebody had weird wind chimes on a cabin somewhere, or maybe it was some kind of natural phenomenon. We figured we'd look it up when we got home and thought nothing of it. We went to bed, and even though it was kind of strange, the sound of the bells did sort of lull us to sleep. The next morning, we found something that turned the whole ordeal from something whimsical to something downright scary. Right in the middle of our campsite, there lay a single sleigh bell, old and slightly rusted. None of us had seen it before, none of us owned anything like it, and none of us could explain how it got there. The sight of it, so out of place this deep in the wilderness, was deeply unsettling. Every single night of our trip, the scenario repeated. The distant ringing of bells, always starting at nightfall and continuing until dawn. Every morning, we would find another singular sleigh bell in the middle of camp. We searched the area, thinking maybe somebody was playing a prank on us, but we never found another sign of a human presence anywhere. Our conversations about the bells became more serious and speculative. We discussed everything from pranksters to supernatural explanations, but none of it made sense. The Smoky Mountains are rich with folklore and legends, but none that we knew of mentioned mysterious bells. On our last night, the ringing was louder, more insistent. It felt like whatever was making the noise was getting closer and more intentional. We barely slept, the sound of bells consuming our thoughts. In the morning, we found not one, 
but several sleigh bells scattered around our tents, one for each of us to be exact. We packed up and left the mountains with more questions than we dared to admit, more questions than any of us really wanted answers to. We talked about reporting it, but what on earth would we say? We were stalked by Santa? It sounded absurd even to us. Hey, we'd like to report sleigh bells in the woods and random bells in our campsite. I mean, come on. Ever since that trip, we've all stayed in touch. Occasionally, we bring up the bells and our theories. Some of us have tried to research similar occurrences, but so far we've come up empty-handed. So here we are, asking if anybody else has experienced this in the Smoky Mountains. The Forgotten Campsite It all started as a weekend camping trip with my two best friends, Alex and Jenna, in the remote woods of Oregon. We had planned this getaway for weeks, aiming for a spot known as the Forgotten Campsite, named so due to its seclusion and the tales that hikers occasionally stumbled upon it by chance. We set out early, our backpacks laden with the essentials, the excitement palpable among us. The hike to the campsite was challenging, but beautiful, taking us through dense forests and along a meandering river. By late afternoon, we found it, a small clearing with an old rusted fire ring at its center, the ground flattened by previous campers. We set up our tents and gathered wood for a fire. As night fell, we cooked dinner over the flames, sharing stories and laughter under the starlit sky. Everything was perfect, or so it seemed. Later, as we settled into our tents, a sense of unease crept over me. The forest, lively with sounds during the day, was eerily silent, as if all the nocturnal creatures had suddenly vanished. I tried to sleep, attributing my unease to the new surroundings. In the middle of the night, I was awakened by a faint whispering outside my tent. At first, I thought it was Alex or Jenna, but a quick glance showed them both asleep. I listened, heart racing, as the whispering grew louder, a chorus of indistinct voices that seemed to encircle our campsite. I nudged Alex awake and he heard it too. We cautiously unzipped the tent, half expecting to find somebody playing a prank, but the clearing was empty, the whispering voices now fading away into the night. The next morning, we discussed the event. Jenna, a very heavy sleeper, had heard nothing. Alex and I were perplexed, but decided that it might have been the wind or some nocturnal animal. As the day progressed, we tried to put the incident behind us, exploring the nearby woods and river. But the sense of unease lingered, a shadow over our previously cheerful spirits. That night, the whispering returned, more coherent this time. We could almost make out words, but not in any language that we recognized. This time, Jenna heard it too. Terrified, we huddled together in one tent, none of us daring to step outside. The next day, we decided to cut our trip short. As we hurriedly packed our gear, I noticed something strange. Small stone-like objects arranged in a circle around our campsite. They had not been there before. The arrangement was deliberate, almost ritualistic. We left the forgotten campsite with more questions than answers. Who had whispered in the night? What did the stone circle signify? Our search for answers in the following weeks turned up nothing. This camping trip, meant to be an escape from the mundane, which I suppose it was, turned into an ordeal that we still talk about to this very day. The Melody of Crater Lake by Jordan L. 
My encounter during a camping trip near Crater Lake in Oregon still puzzles me. Crater Lake, known for its deep blue water and legends, seemed like the perfect spot for a solo camping adventure. I was looking for peace and quiet, but what I found was mystery. I set up camp in a secluded spot with a view of the lake. The first day was blissful. I hiked around the area, taking in the stunning scenery. As night fell, I sat by my campfire, the stars reflecting off the lake's surface, creating an almost otherworldly atmosphere. That's when I first heard it, a soft, haunting melody drifting across the lake. It sounded like a flute, but sweeter, more ethereal. I looked around, trying to find the source, but there was no one in sight. The music seemed to be coming from the lake itself. Intrigued and a bit unnerved, I decided to investigate. I walked along the shore, the melody growing louder, more compelling. It was as if the music was calling to me, pulling me toward a hidden secret of the lake. As I reached a clearing by the water's edge, the music suddenly stopped. The silence was abrupt, almost jarring. I stood there, confused, looking out over the calm waters. There was a ripple, as if something had just submerged, but other than that, nothing. I returned to my campsite, my mind racing with questions. I barely slept, the memory of the melody replaying in my mind. The next morning, I asked a park ranger about it. He smiled and said that others had reported hearing strange music around the lake, usually at night. Some believed it was the wind, others thought it was something more mystical, but nobody ever thought it was threatening, and neither did I. The rest of my trip was uneventful, but the melody lingered. On my last night, I heard it again. This time, I just listened, letting the mysterious music wash over me. It almost felt like a farewell, a closing serenade from the depths of Crater Lake. My camping trip there was over, and sadly I had to leave. And as unsettling and sometimes mysterious as I find the whole thing, I'm also really looking forward to going back. Like I said, it didn't strike me as being threatening, just odd. And who couldn't use a little touch of whimsy from time to time? The night I can't explain. I've got a story that I just need to share with someone, and I think maybe this is the right place. This happened last summer, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. So I'm an avid camper. I love the outdoors, the whole nine yards. Last July, I decided to go solo camping in this pretty remote area that I'd been to a few times before. It's peaceful off the beaten path, and you rarely run into anyone else. Perfect for a little solitude, right? I set up camp, had a small fire going, and everything was just as usual. Beautiful night, clear skies, the sound of the wilderness around me. I eventually dozed off. But then things started to get weird. I woke up, I'm guessing around 2 a.m., and there was this strange feeling in the air like electricity almost. I stepped out of my tent to get some fresh air, thinking I was just being paranoid. But then I saw it. Across the small clearing, there was this faint bluish light hovering just above the ground. It wasn't like any flashlight or camp light. It was different. It kind of pulsed softly, moving slightly. I rubbed my eyes thinking I was dreaming, but it was still there when I looked again. I felt this weird mix of fear and curiosity. I couldn't move closer though. My body just wouldn't let me. So I just stood there, watching this light dance around for what felt like hours, but must have been just a few minutes. And then just as suddenly as it appeared, it vanished. Just poof, gone. No sound, no trace, nothing. 
the normal night sounds came back and that electric feeling in the air disappeared. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night, just sat by the extinguished fire trying to process what I'd seen. In the morning, I checked around, thinking I would find some kind of logical explanation, but there was nothing. No burn marks, no footprints, nothing out of the ordinary at all. I've told a few close friends and they suggested everything from ball lightning to sleep paralysis, but I was fully awake and it didn't feel like any natural phenomenon I know of. Has anyone else experienced anything like this while camping? Or am I just losing it? The Night Visitor My camping trip to Starlight Camp, a small, lesser-known site nestled in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, was supposed to be a weekend of relaxation. It turned out to be anything but. I arrived on a Friday afternoon, the campsite quiet with just a few other campers in the distance. I set up my tent in a cozy spot near a stream, looking forward to a weekend of fishing and reading. The first night was pretty peaceful, filled with the sounds of the forest and the gentle flow of the stream. I fell asleep quickly, tired from the drive and the setup. I woke up sometime around midnight, unsure why at first. The fire had died down to glowing embers and the forest was silent, a bit too silent. And that's when I noticed the silhouette outside of my tent. It looked like a person standing there, motionless. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I called out, asking if they needed help. There was no answer. Against my better judgment, I unzipped the tent slowly, my heart pounding. But as I looked out, the figure was gone. I scanned the area with my flashlight, but there was no sign of anyone. I told myself it was probably just a trick of the shadows, or maybe another camper wandering by and I just thought they were standing there. All the stupid things you tell yourself when you're trying to convince yourself that you didn't see what you just saw. The next day was uneventful, filled with fishing and exploring the nearby trails. I met a few other campers, but none of them seemed to be out late the previous night. That night I stayed up, curious to see if the silhouette would return. The hours ticked by, and just as I was about to give up and go to sleep, I saw it again the same figure standing at the edge of the campsite. This time, I didn't hesitate. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped out of the tent. As I approached, the figure seemed to blur and shift, almost like a wisp of smoke caught in a gentle breeze. And then it just dissipated. I stood there, flashlight in hand, trying to make sense of it. There was nothing there, no tracks, no sign of anyone having been there at all. I didn't sleep much that night, my mind racing with questions. Was it a ghost? A trick of the light? My imagination? In the morning, I asked around, but again, none of the other campers had seen anything unusual or been out late. I left Starlight Camp with a mix of relief and curiosity. The experience of the night visitor was something I couldn't easily shake off. I suppose it wasn't threatening, but it was bizarre, an unexplained anomaly in an otherwise normal weekend, but it definitely left me more concerned than relaxed. I've thought about going back, maybe to try to see it again or to get some answers, but every time I think about it, I think better of it. The Shadow at Priest Lake My unsettling encounter during a camping trip in northern Idaho near Priest Lake remains a vivid memory. Priest Lake, with its crystal clear waters and dense forests, is a haven for campers and hikers. 
I went there with a group of friends for a weekend getaway, unaware of the eerie experience that awaited us. We set up camp in a remote area near the lake shore. The first day was perfect, kayaking, fishing, and exploring the surrounding wilderness. As the sun set, we gathered around the campfire, sharing stories and enjoying the tranquil beauty of the lake. That night, after we had all settled into our tents, I was awakened by a strange noise outside. It sounded like whispers, but disjointed and inconsistent. Thinking it might be one of my friends, I stepped out of the tent. The campfire was out and the moon cast a pale light over the campsite. The whispers stopped abruptly, and I noticed something moving at the edge of the forest. It was a shadowy figure just beyond the reach of the moonlight. It seemed to be watching us. I called out, thinking maybe somebody was lost and needed help, but the figure didn't respond. Instead, it slowly retreated into the trees. I woke up a couple of my friends, and we tried to find the figure with our flashlights. But it was gone. We were all a bit spooked and nobody slept much that night. The next day we asked around at other campsites and even talked to a park ranger, but no one else had seen anything unusual. We tried to brush it off, but the encounter had left us feeling uneasy. That night the whispers returned, more coherent this time, as if someone or something was speaking in a language we couldn't understand. Again, the shadowy figure appeared at the edge of the forest, but this time it was closer. It was tall and thin, and it almost blended into the trees. We all put our flashlight beams on it, but the light seemed to just pass right through, as if the figure was made of smoke. As quickly as it showed up, it vanished, and we were left in stunned silence. We decided to leave in the morning, cutting our trip short. It was just too unsettling to ignore, and none of us could get any sleep anyway. We packed up our gear, still glancing around, a little bit nervous of the tree line. Since that trip, I've heard some stories from other campers I know about strange sightings near Priest Lake, tales of shadowy figures and unexplained whispers in the night. Some say it's just the wind, or animals, but others believe it's something a little bit more ominous. Whatever it was, we're never going back. The Vanishing Camper I've camped in many places, but nothing compares to the experience I had last summer in the deep woods. It was a secluded forest in the Pacific Northwest, known for its old growth trees and pristine lakes. This trip, which I embarked on alone, left me with an eerie story and a lingering sense of really not knowing what I encountered. I arrived at the woods on a sunny afternoon found a spot near a small lake and set up camp. The first day passed peacefully, filled with hiking and enjoying the solitude. As night fell, I built a fire, cooked a simple meal, and relaxed under the stars. That night, I was awoken by the sound of footsteps outside my tent. I assumed it was a deer or some other animal, so I ignored it and tried to get back to sleep. But then I heard a voice a man's voice, calling out softly, Hello? Is someone there? Curious and a little bit concerned, I got out of my tent. A few yards away stood a man. He looked to be in his forties, dressed in camping gear, and a bewildered look on his face. He told me that his name was Tom, and that he had gotten lost while hiking. He asked if he could share my fire, as his supplies were low. Cautiously, I agreed. We sat by the fire and Tom shared his story. He said he'd been hiking for days, unable to find his way back to any familiar trail. His story struck me as odd, 
How could someone survive that long being so lost? But I chalked it up to luck and a survival instinct and probably years of experience. The next morning, Tom was gone. His disappearance was as sudden as his arrival. No trace of him remained, not even footprints. It was as though he just vanished into thin air sometime during the night. A little weirded out by this, I decided to hike back to the ranger station. I mentioned Tom and described his appearance and situation. I thought the ranger might be concerned and jot down some notes, but instead he was shocked. He showed me a missing person poster. It was Tom, but the poster was old, dated five years ago. Tom had gone missing in these woods and had never been found. Chills ran down my spine as I looked at the poster. The man I had spoken to, the man who had shared my fire, was a missing person, lost to these woods years ago. How could that be? Was it a ghost, a figment of my imagination, some overlap of reality, or something else entirely? That encounter with Tom was something I just couldn't explain. And that experience has stayed with me forever. This experience happened to me a couple of years ago, and I never found an explanation for it. However, my dad recently found someone on Reddit with a very similar story to mine that happened around the same time and in the same area. I reached out to that person, and they said that I was the fifth person to reach out, saying that they had experienced something similar. So I figured I would share my story and see if this has happened to anyone else. Some friends and I had gone camping up in a canyon in Utah. This was in 2020. Some creepy stuff had happened earlier in the night before I made it to the campground. So we were trying to relax, wind down and have some fun like we had planned. We were in high school at this point, so we were doing stupid games like truth or dare and whatnot. It was four friends, our friend's dog, and me. There was only one other group somewhat close to us, a couple and their dog, who set up their tent a few yards away. They weren't close enough to interact with us at all, though. My friends and I were staying up and talking, laughing, etc. When at some point it sounded like somebody's car alarm went off, maybe five to ten miles up the canyon. The next campsite was pretty far away from ours. We didn't question the sound and went on talking until we noticed that the sound had gotten noticeably closer. It happened so gradually that we didn't notice it at first until it sounded like it was just a few yards away. The noisier we were, the closer it would get to us. As we whispered amongst ourselves about what could be making the sound, it came closer and closer. Finally, the noise was literally just outside our tent, mere inches away from us. None of us dared speak or move an inch in fear of compromising our safety. When we became quiet, so did the noise. After we were dead silent for a few minutes, the noise started up again and began to once again go farther away until it sounded like it was about 10 miles away again. This all happened in the span of 10 to 20 seconds. As the night went on, we heard the noise travel from campsite to campsite in almost no time at all. It didn't go away completely until about three o'clock in the morning. We tried to stay pretty quiet for the rest of the night. All in all, Whatever had made this sound traveled the span of roughly five to 10 miles in the span of five to 10 minutes. After that one time when we quieted down, it started up again and then it went back to where it started. That was about 20 seconds of it. Either way, this thing was going like a mile per minute. It wasn't a vehicle because there was no engine sound along with it, no headlights. 
It wasn't human because there wasn't a single footstep or twig crunch, not even when it was right outside our tent. It made zero noise aside from the beeping. It didn't sound like any animal that any of us knew about, and it traveled way too fast and was much too loud to be any animal, at least any we have around here. We originally thought that the sound was either a vehicle or a machine of some kind because of the consistent pattern of the beeping. However, when we stopped to listen to it for a while, there was a brief moment when the pattern got slightly off tempo, but it sounded accidental and then it quickly returned to the beat. This led us to believe that something was imitating the sound of a machine or a vehicle. We considered everything from weird nocturnal birds to pranksters with an air horn, but nothing added up. We ended up waking up the next morning at 5 a.m. to pack up and leave. The other campers who were sleeping a few yards away from us were already completely gone by the time we got up. This leads us to believe that whatever was messing with us that night had messed with them too. I wish we could have seen our friend's dog's reaction to what happened, but he had already fallen asleep by 8 or 9 p.m., long before the beeping started. It started at about 11 o'clock or midnight, and that dog can sleep through anything. I recently got together with those same friends and brought up what happened that night. One of my friends said that when the rest of us fell asleep, the same thing happened again. But. Instead of a car alarm, this time the sound was a crying baby, traveling at the same speed and distance as before. And according to her, it circled our tent a few times before fading off again. The people who were camping closest to us did not have a baby. Oh, and one other detail. We were less than 50 miles away from Skinwalker Ranch. I work as a park warden in the Canadian wilderness, typically spending my shifts in solitude from 5.30 at night to 2.30 in the morning. My jurisdiction covers around 300 campsites, several beaches, and the corresponding amenities, such as shower facilities. My park closes for the harsh Canadian winter, typically from mid-October to early April, during which feet of snow accumulate and the cold is unforgiving. Several years ago, a tragic incident occurred. A man chose to take his own life with a sawed-off shotgun by the river on one of the more secluded beaches. His body wasn't discovered until the spring thaw. This particular beach, situated at the northernmost part of the park, requires a patrol at least once an evening. One overcast day, around 7 p.m., I was at the shower facilities near this beach ensuring the first aid kits were stocked and checking the fire extinguishers. The dreary weather had deterred any visitors, leaving the beach and parking lot deserted, except for my patrol vehicle. Suddenly, I was overcome by a sense of dread. I ran to my vehicle, slamming the door shut and taking a few calming breaths to shake off the panic. Feeling somewhat better, if not confused, I stayed in the safety of my locked vehicle completing paperwork and logs. Given my job, not a lot scares me, so I was more shaken by the fact that I responded that way, still not knowing what caused it. Out of nowhere, a large dark figure moved swiftly past my driver's side window. Startled, I let out a scream, instinctively recoiling as I thought somebody was attempting to break the glass or open the door. However, when I checked, there was no one around. Needless to say, I delegated all future maintenance tasks in that area to the day shift and hurried out of there. It might not be the scariest story ever told, but it deeply unsettled me. Even after three years, I steadfastly refused to conduct foot patrols in that area after sundown.
echoes of laughter. I've always found solace in the woods near my home in a small New England town, a place where the dense canopy of trees and the soft earthy path beneath my feet offered a respite from the noise of daily life. It was during one of these escapes, on a day when the autumn air was crisp and the leaves painted a mosaic of fiery hues, that I experienced something that would forever alter my perception of these woods. The day was like any other, with the sun casting dappled shadows through the branches. The only sounds were the crunch of leaves underfoot, maybe the distant call of a bird. I was deep in thought. I was just pondering the turns my life had taken. Then a sound sliced through the solitude, a child's laughter, clear and unmistakable. It was a joyful sound, but in the context of the deserted woods, it was unnervingly out of place. I stopped dead in my tracks, listening intently. The laughter came again, this time seemingly closer. My initial confusion quickly turned to concern. What was a child doing out here alone, so far from many of the town's homes? The thought that somebody might be lost or in trouble spurred me into action. I began to search the area from where I thought the laughter had originated. As I moved through the underbrush, calling out with reassurances that I meant no harm, the laughter continued. It seemed to dance around me, now from one direction, then from another, as elusive as the shifting breeze. Despite my best efforts, I saw no sign of anybody. The laughter, so full of life, was juxtaposed against the stillness of the woods, creating an eerie atmosphere that sent shivers down my spine. Still, I was determined to find the source. I ventured further, the laughter guiding me deeper into the woods than I had ever been before. The trees here grew closer together, their branches intertwining like clasped fingers, casting the ground into perpetual twilight. The air grew colder, and a sense of unease began to settle over me. The laughter, once innocent, now carried a mocking tone, as if enjoying a game only it understood. After what felt like hours, I found myself in a clearing I had never seen before. The laughter stopped as abruptly as it had started, leaving a silence behind that was so heavy it felt like a physical presence. I stood there, catching my breath, looking around for any sign of life, but there was none. The feeling of being watched was overwhelming, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. It was then that I noticed the gravestones, half hidden by overgrowth, scattered around the clearing. My heart sank as the realization sunk in. This was the forgotten resting place of the early settlers of the town, their existence erased by time and memory. The names on the gravestones were barely legible, worn away by centuries of weather, but the dates were clear enough. These were the graves of children, victims of the harsh realities of colonial life. The laughter had led me to this place, a hidden monument to lives cut short, their joy frozen in time. As I stood there, a deep sorrow filled me, not just for the children who had died, but for the loss of innocence that the laughter in the woods represented. It felt as though the laughter was their way of reaching out, a reminder that they too once lived and played and loved. Even if all that remained of them were these weathered stones and the echoes of their laughter. The Cave of Unseen Horrors My fascination with unexplored places led me to a dense forest on the outskirts of my hometown. It was a place rumored to be untouched by modern hands. It was here, amidst the thick underbrush and ancient trees, that I discovered an inconspicuous cave entrance, partially hidden by moss, 
and the overgrowth of the decades. The thrill of discovery pulsed through me as I prepared to enter, completely unaware of what awaited me. Had I known what I was getting into, perhaps I would have turned around. But perhaps it would have been even more motivating. I can't really say. All I know is that I did enter, and what happened, happened. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The cave was surprisingly spacious, its walls stretched out and upward into the darkness. I flicked on my flashlight. The beam cut through the gloom and revealed the first of the paintings that adorned the cave's interior. At first glance, they seemed to just be simple prehistoric art pieces, the kind of rudimentary figures and shapes one might expect in such a place. But as I ventured farther, the nature of the paintings changed, and so did the feeling in the air. What was once excitement very quickly turned into a growing sense of dread. That feeling that you shouldn't be where you are. The paintings depicted scenes of daily life at first. Hunting, gathering, the camaraderie of what I assumed were the cave's ancient inhabitants. But as I progressed deeper into the cave, the scenes took on a darker tone. The figures, once depicted in harmonious activities, were now shown in acts of violence and despair. Among these were images of creatures that didn't resemble any animal or thing that I ever knew of. Twisted forms that seemed to leap out of the walls with an unsettling realism. One series of paintings in particular caught my attention and refused to let go. It told a story that began with the arrival of a dark figure, depicted as a shadowy silhouette much larger than the human figures surrounding it. This figure brought with it other creatures, the same monstrous forms I had seen earlier. What followed was a tale of chaos. The humans, armed with spears and arrows, clashing with these beings in a desperate struggle for survival. The most disturbing part was the final scene. It showed a mass of these creatures, victorious, standing over a group of humans who were kneeling, their postures indicative of surrender or worship. Above this scene, painted with a precision that belied the primitive tools that must have created it, was a larger depiction of the dark figure, its arms raised, almost like it was triumphant. The detail that made me stop in my tracks, the thing I'll never get out of my head, was the unmistakable depiction of joy on the creature's face, if such a monstrosity could be said to have a face. I stood there in the dim light, the silence of the cave suddenly threatening as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. The air felt heavier, charged with an energy that seemed to come from the paintings themselves. It was like the emotions of fear and despair and malicious triumph were still alive. The realization that these paintings were not merely artistic expressions, but a historical record of some forgotten horror was overwhelming. I felt an urgent need to leave, to escape the oppressive atmosphere of the cave, the gaze of that dark figure that seemed to be turning its attention toward me, even from the static painting. Once outside, the brightness of the day was blinding. The sounds of the forest were almost disorienting after being in the silence of the cave. Everything seemed loud and overwhelming, and it took me a moment to catch my breath. My mind raced to process what I had just seen. This forest was once a place of beauty and mystery. It was enchanting to me, a place I could go to feel safe, and now, it felt ominous, as though it concealed truths too terrifying to comprehend. I've never returned to that cave, nor have I spoken about it until now. The experience left me with many questions, but I've never really done any work to find the answers. I don't really want to, I don't think. That painting in that cave told a disturbing story, 
one that challenges every perception of history and humanity's place within it that I had ever known before. I think if I let myself, I could think about that painting and what it means forever. But that obsession, I fear, would only lead me down a road that might make me one of the people on my knees worshipping something that seeks my doom. The Shadow of the Old Woods It was during a solo hiking trip in the Appalachian Mountains that I stumbled upon an old, weathered forest ranger named Jack. He was the kind of man whose deep wrinkles told stories of countless seasons spent under the sun and the moon, guarding the secrets of the woods. We shared a campfire one chilly evening, the kind where the crackle of the flames seems to encourage the sharing of tales and legends. It was there, amidst the dance of shadows cast by the fire, that he told me about the shadow that roams the woods. Jack's voice was low and gravelly, each word carefully weighed as he spoke of a presence that had haunted these mountains for as long as he could remember. It's not like any shadow you cast on a sunny day, he said, staring into the flames. This one moves with intent, following hikers, appearing at the corner of your vision, then vanishing before you can truly see it. He warned me that those who sought it out seldom found anything, and those who did wish they hadn't. His advice was to ignore it if I ever felt its presence, to not let curiosity lead me astray. I listened, fascinated but skeptical. Tales of haunted woods and wandering spirits were common in places as old and wild as the Appalachians. I thanked him for the story and the warmth of the fire, and then retreated to my tent, the ranger's words lingering in my mind as I drifted off to sleep. The next day, under a sky so blue it felt like a promise, I set out to explore the dense forest. The beauty of the natural world around me made Jack's eerie tale seem like a hundred miles away. That was until the sun began to set, and the woods took on a different character. Shadows grew long, and the path less distinct, the sounds of the day giving way to the whispers of the night. That's when I felt it an inexplicable chill that seemed to wrap around me despite the absence of any breeze. Remembering Jack's story, I quickened my pace, but out of the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of something, a formless shadow that moved between the trees. I stopped, heart racing, and turned to look directly at it, but found nothing. I convinced myself it was just my imagination spurred by the ranger's story, and continued on. However, the sensation of being followed persisted, growing stronger with every step. It felt as though the temperature had dropped several degrees in the area surrounding me. I could see my breath in the air. Then, without warning, the shadow appeared again, this time directly in my path. It was darker than the twilight around us, a void of light, and it seemed to be looking right at me, if such a thing could look. Panic took hold and I did the only thing that made sense. I ran. The path was barely visible now, but fear lent speed to my legs. The sound of my own footsteps was a desperate rhythm in the quiet of the forest. I didn't glance behind me, fearing that the shadow would be there just inches away. Eventually, the lights of my camp came into view, a beacon of safety. I burst into the clearing, gasping for air, and spun around to confront my pursuer. But there was nothing. The woods behind me were calm, the path empty. It was as though the shadow had never been there at all. I spent a restless night in my tent, jumping at every noise. By the time dawn broke, I had made up my mind to leave. As I packed my gear, Jack found me. 
His look told me that he understood what had happened without needing to ask. Some things in these woods are better left alone, he said. I nodded, unable to find the words to say anything else. The Vanishing Trail Last winter, during the peak of a particularly harsh snowstorm, I found myself alone in my family's cabin, nestled in the woods of northern Minnesota. With my parents away for the weekend, the vast, untouched snow around our property seemed like a blank canvas, inviting me to leave my mark. On the second day, the storm had calmed, and a thick blanket of snow covered everything in sight. That morning, I decided to venture out for a walk in the serene, snow-covered landscape. I was about half a mile from the cabin, enjoying the muffled silence that only a snowy landscape can provide, when I noticed an odd set of footprints in the snow. They appeared suddenly about 20 feet from where I was standing, as if whoever made them had simply dropped from the sky. The footprints were unlike anything I'd seen before, larger than a human's, with a strange elongated shape, and what seemed like two sets of toes. Curiosity piqued, I decided to follow them, wondering if they might belong to some unknown animal, or if there was a logical explanation. The trail led me deeper into the woods, winding through areas I had never ventured into before. The snow here was deeper, untouched by wind or animal, I noticed the spacing between the footprints was inconsistent, sometimes close together, other times so far apart it was as if the creature had leaped forward. Despite the cold, a bead of sweat ran down my forehead, the thrill of the unknown driving me forward. After about twenty minutes of following the trail, I realized the woods had grown unnervingly silent. No birds, no distant sounds of civilization, nothing but the sound of my own breathing and the crunch of snow under my feet. It was then I felt a chilling sense of being watched. I stopped, scanning the dense trees around me, but saw nothing. The feeling, however, did not subside. It grew stronger, a palpable pressure in the air that made it hard to breathe. I turned my attention back to the trail, but then I found that it ended Abruptly, there was no sign of the creature, no indication of where it could have gone. The snow around the final set of footprints was undisturbed, as pristine as if the woods themselves were untouched. I circled the area, searching for any sign that the trail continued, but there was nothing. It was as if whatever made those footprints had simply vanished into thin air. The silence was broken by a sudden crack from somewhere deep in the woods, loud enough to startle me. My heart pounded in my chest as I realized I was no longer intrigued by this mystery, but terrified. The isolation of my surroundings, the inexplicable end of the trail, and the oppressive silence, all converged into a singular thought. I was not alone, and perhaps I was not welcome. Without another moment's hesitation, I turned and hurried back the way I'd come, the sense of being watched never leaving me. I moved quickly, almost running. I didn't dare look back, I didn't know what I would see. The journey back seemed to take longer. Every noise made me jump, every shadow was a potential harbinger of something terrible. When I finally burst through the door of the cabin, I was completely out of breath, my heart racing. I locked the door behind me and spent the rest of the day looking out the windows. I almost expected to see something staring back, or descending from the sky and landing to create a new set of tracks, but there was nothing. Just the falling snow and the dense trees swaying in the wind. The rest of the weekend passed without incident, and when my parents returned I told them about the footprints and how the trail ended so mysteriously. They listened with a mix of amusement and concern, 
suggesting perhaps it was a prank or an animal I was just unfamiliar with. But I knew of no animal or person who could make those prints and then just disappear. I've gone back to those woods many times since, each visit marked by a cautious curiosity. I've never found another trail like that one and part of me is grateful. The experience left me with a deep sense of the vast unexplained mysteries that lie hidden in the natural world and the unsettling realization that some things are beyond our understanding. This is one of the many things that I have never told to anyone before, because I'm pretty sure that nobody would have believed me, thinking that my imagination was just wild and sometimes I still doubt that anybody will believe me. But I remember this happening for real, so I wanted to share. This thing happened to me in the past when I was around nine, and I always used to hang out with my oldest cousin, who was seven back then. We were pretty inseparable at the time, before everything changed when he turned 18. I was spending the night at my granny's house, as I used to be her personal dog sitter, and he decided to come hang out with me. He suggested that it was a good idea to go into the nearest forest, which was almost right next to her house. We were living in a medium-sized city, but the forest is almost always near buildings at some parts or areas. Around 10 or 11 p.m., we decided just to walk to the edge of the forest, since it would have been completely foolish to go deep into the forest that late. I told him that that would be a good idea, since we were both kind of bored and feeling adventurous. We headed out and just started to walk toward the edge of the forest, both up for having a small adventure. But that didn't even last a half hour before the weird things started to happen. I remember when I was standing against a big tree and looking just in front of me, my cousin was near my side, like six or seven inches away from me. I was looking in front of me and I felt like I was searching for something. I'm still unclear of what exactly it was, but I was just looking. All of a sudden, I saw red eyes staring at me from out of nowhere, but they were really far from us. I turned toward my cousin and asked if he was seeing what I was, but he ignored my question. So I turned back to look at the eyes and they were much closer than before. I blinked a few times, but of course I couldn't see anything around them and they weren't getting closer. I just saw trees. I turned back to him and asked the same question, but he kept ignoring me. So I turned one last time to look at them to see that they were even closer and closer. I just kept watching them, feeling a little bit afraid at this moment, and I swear that they started to come toward me, even when I didn't look away. So I just grabbed his hand and ran as quickly as I could until we saw the street lamps. After that, I've never seen or experienced the same thing ever again. The weirdest thing in hindsight is that I never heard it getting closer. I never heard anything at all. Even if it had been like a wolf or a dog or something like that, I would have heard rustling or branches or something, but there was just nothing. It's been 16 years since this happened and it has always stayed with me. From May of 2010 to May of 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20 minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there quit after a few days because they got so creeped out being alone at the dam at night, and that he was glad I was sticking it out. In truth, it could be creepy. Sometimes at night, when I was patrolling the basement level of the dam itself, 
I would think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the water line, on the low side, the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. Sometimes I'd hear weird noises in the woods, or catch a flash of a shadow while I was inside the dam. It takes a lot to scare me though, and I knew I was either hearing critters in the woods, or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night, however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little after 11 p.m., and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I heard a tap at the door. What was creepy about the guardhouse at night was that when you had the lamp inside turned on, people could look through the windows at you, but the glare made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. Then the tap came again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. There was no one there. Then I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened it, was a huge man, at least 400 pounds, wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. The sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering. My blood ran cold. I was so scared I couldn't speak. As it turns out, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridge over the trail race and he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet, because they usually started a little before 11, and that was what always drew in the big striped bass. He was smeared with blood because he'd already caught and gutted a couple and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realized that he had approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I was unarmed security, because if I'd had a gun, I would have either shot him or accidentally shot myself while trying to shoot him. Either way, paranormal or not, that was the scariest night of my life working that job. In 2008, I was in the Navy. We were over a hundred miles from any land, and it was about three to four in the morning off the coast of Peru. I was an electronics technician, so I worked in radio with one other guy, a radio man, and we just sat up scanning the HF, UHF, and VHF radios listening for drug runners. We intercepted a UHF signal that played a short piano preamble followed by a haunting, computerized-sounding woman's voice, reading numbers. Eleven. Nine. Four. Six. This went on for about a minute. Then the preamble repeated, followed by the same number sequence. Then it was gone. We recorded the transmission, wrote the numbers down, informed the captain, and shortly, a message was sent off to the area commander about the strange message. The reply we received was, Disregard. Creeped me out. I came to find out that this is a number station, and while the phenomenon is not entirely understood, it's likely a method for getting a secure message or code to an intelligence agent in the field over an insecure method of communication. Since the numbers could be attached to a one-time code, it's basically indecipherable. Either way, it was super creepy. I was big into off-trail hiking. I would usually track animals and find really cool spots to hang out, meditate, and smoke a bowl. I had a good friend that was into doing the same thing, and one weekend we decided to go hiking together 
find some killer views, smoke a bowl and talk about life. Well, we got lost. The road we wanted to take was closed, and we decided to follow the detour and see where it would take us. I should mention that we were in the middle of nowhere. The mountains are beautiful and are filled with hidden streams and waterfalls, but they are almost inaccessible due to the terrain. I have been out to the area many times and never encountered a single soul. Anyhow, back to the detour. The road should have connected with another arterial, but soon we found ourselves on a logging road that dead-ended in the middle of the middle of nowhere. We thought this was weird, but we were like, okay, cool, an adventure. We see what looks like an old logging trail and decide to take an animal trail to the south of it. We gather up our bags and let out my German Shepherd, a rescue dog and the best darn dog that I ever had. This is important because to get everything we needed, we had to walk around my truck. We head out about 30 minutes into the trail and we start to feel like we're being watched. It was a bad feeling, like the kind of bad that makes your stomach drop and instinct take over. Relevant side note, I left home when I was 16 and was homeless for a while. There is nothing like a situation like that to teach you how to have eyes in the back of your head. Back to the story. The forest is silent. Not a bird moving in a tree, not a squirrel. Literally, there is no noise. It is supernaturally calm. And then, we hear a stick break about 30 feet behind us on the trail. We assume that it's a cougar, as they frequent these mountains, and so we kept pressing on, but the feeling doesn't pass. I motion for my friend to keep talking as I slide off into the brush and double back. I have my dog with me, a hunting knife, and some bear spray. I'm still wanting to believe that it's a cougar, so I figure that I'll be okay. As I get close to a turn in the trail, I hear some crashing in the bushes. Odd, because the forest is still silent, but again, it could be a bear, a cougar, something like that. My dog goes running toward the sound and then stops and begins growling. I figure the gig is up and I step back out onto the trail. And that is when I notice a third set of footprints, new, large, and male. I pretend that my dog is lost and then head on back down the trail to catch up with my friend. I mouth to her that I saw another set of footprints and at that time, we decide to climb higher up onto the mountain so that we can see if anyone is approaching from below. I'm pretty sure that this decision saved our lives. As we're hiking back to the car, we discover several hunting blinds. This is off-season hunting, and it's illegal, and most of the animals people really want to poach are still higher up in the mountains. But there was still warm food sitting on a plate. It was eerie as hell. We flat out booked it off the mountain so fast with my dog running off and growling at the person that we now know was following us. We unlock my truck as soon as we see it and grab my dog in as we're pulling away. And that's when we notice the flat tire. Someone had sliced my tire to shreds. This is when I said, screw it and gave thanks for having a sturdy truck that I didn't care about. I didn't care if I ruined the car, the axle or the wheel. I just wanted out of there. When we got down to the highway, a term I use loosely, I pull over and patch the tire and pump it full of air as fast as I can. I know that we saw something we shouldn't have seen. We made it to a gas station, just barely. Also very creepy, complete with the old man and dusty cans of beans. Change the tire and then drive as fast as we can back into cell range where we call the cops. I don't think that they believed us. 
I'm pretty sure they thought it was an animal. But people go missing in the woods all the time around here, especially in that area. Unfortunately, I didn't know this until I got home and did some research. That was the end of my off-trail hikes. I now only go on heavily populated trails with a group of people, and I always leave the name of the hike and a map along with my expected return time with my best friend. It isn't nearly as enjoyable, but it sure is a heck of a lot safer. Moral of the story? Trust your instincts. Tell someone where you're going and when you'll be back. Carry bear spray and your survival pack. Always have an emergency repair kit in your car, a battery charger, air pump for your tire, a patching kit, flares, and a couple of flashlights. No matter how safe and reliable you think the location you're going to is. I forgot to mention earlier, we saw the same footprints leading from the shelter down to the animal trail we had been on. There is no doubt in my mind that we were being stalked, if not hunted. So, I'm an avid caver from West Virginia, and there's this cave not far from me that's been one of my favorites to explore. It's often my go-to cave to take friends and newcomers to to get them into caving, as it's rather easily accessible and not too challenging of a cave. Although, it is a rather large cave system. The first thing to note is that there's never any wildlife seen in or near the cave, and I've only ever seen a few bats for as large of a cave as it is. Anyway, the first really strange thing to happen was that my friends and I stumbled upon a pentagram made out of salt with a dead bird in the middle, circled by what seemed to be freshly burnt out candles. Obviously it was freaky, but we took it to be a prank by some teens or something along those lines. I've always been very comfortable going through this cave and leading treks, but up until now I had always been with a group of friends. One day, I decided to take my girlfriend through, so just the two of us went. We didn't make it past the first chamber, because I just had such an uneasy feeling. It was as if I just needed to get out of there. My way of describing it is the feeling of being watched, but on steroids. I've been in some sketchy places, but I've never had that sense of dread in all my life. The next thing to happen is that a group of us went back in and stumbled upon a newer looking jacket far back into the cave that was never there before. I wouldn't have taken it to be so odd, but it seemed to be a rather expensive jacket with no apparent damage or reason to just leave it laying behind randomly far back in this portion of the cave. There was also nobody else around at this time. The next thing to happen was when a group of us friends were exploring, and on the way back out, one of my most serious friends just seemed really strange and off. Finally, I asked him if he was good, and he nodded and quickly told me to just keep moving. Once we got out of the cave, he pulled me aside privately, which is really not like him, but he told me that he didn't think it was a good idea to go back in there. I finally convinced him to tell me why, and he told me that he swore he saw a person back there. From what he could see, a very pale, lanky person. He couldn't quite make it out at first, but he said that he noticed it following us. He even tried calling out a few times, but we didn't think anything of him doing that at the time, because it's fun to yell and make echoes. Anyway, after this experience, I convinced the same friend to go back with me, along with our other buddy, to reach an extremely difficult place that I haven't been able to access yet, seeing as I've just been taking newbies. As we arrived at the cave, there was a man and woman camping nearby who were standing at the entrance. We made a friendly conversation and asked if they were going inside. They said no, they were just checking it out. So we continued on. 
After reaching our goal and being at the dead end of a very tight spot, we laid and rested for a while. Then we heard people. We all heard it at the same time as we looked at each other and squinted. We couldn't quite make out what they were saying as it was very distant and echoed and muffled, but we could clearly make out that it was English, male and female voices, and we heard laughter and water splashing. We thought it was pretty odd because it was in the morning and we didn't expect anyone else around but those two campers, so we figured it was them. Anyway, as we were exhausted, we rested for a good while longer and shut off our lights to save battery. We remained quiet as we were just resting, and after a while, we couldn't hear them anymore. Then we went ahead and made our way back out of the cave. As we exited, the man and woman were still there by the entrance. My friend asked, so you decided to go in after all? The man replied, no, why? And we asked if anyone else had gone in or out, and they said they hadn't seen anybody the entire time. At this point, we were creeped out as we all clearly heard voices, but we didn't really talk about it much amongst each other. Much later, while doing research, I started putting things together in my head and realized that my friend's description was very Wendigo-esque. And then I recalled how they're very often known for being able to imitate human voices to lure prey. And it just really creeped me out. I almost wouldn't believe what he said he saw, but if you understood the person that I was talking about, if you knew him, He's not someone to ever make up something like that. Anyway, I hope you found the story interesting. I still don't know what we encountered, but if you have any ideas, let me know. This was back when I was living with my mom, aunt, and brother. We lived in a townhouse. It was like a large house with a smaller house inside of it. My aunt owned the house, so she was alone in the larger house, which was two floors. And my mom and I lived in the smaller house. We shared the bedroom, and my brother lived in the basement. One night, my mom was in the living room watching TV. I couldn't tell you what show, but she really only watches old sitcoms, so it's a dead giveaway that this couldn't have been the TV. My brother worked as a landscaper, so by this hour, he was almost always fast asleep. Our bedroom has an outside facing wall, facing the very large fenced in backyard, and behind it, a small stretch of woodland bordered by a reservoir. There isn't any room for anything larger than a coyote to live there and nothing larger is native to the area, considering that we live in the suburbs. There are mountain lions a little over an hour north, but wolves and other predators are not native at all. Around 1 a.m., I heard this blood-curdling scream. Before you say anything, yes, I am aware of mountain lion screams, and I've listened to them extensively, but this was absolutely not a mountain lion. It wasn't a fox either, or any other animal that I could think of that we have here, but I'm open to suggestions if you think you know any. It goes on for a good 10 or so minutes while I lay paralyzed with fear. It sounds almost like children screaming, except deeper and more terrified. It genuinely sounded like someone being killed. The next morning, I asked my mom about it and she said she didn't hear anything. My brother said that he did, but he thought that I was just up watching TV, or that maybe my aunt was fighting with her boyfriend. My aunt thought it was my mom having a temper tantrum. To this day, I don't know what it was, and though I don't live there anymore, it still makes me very afraid.
I will preface this by saying that I have never seen a ghost. I believed in them in my youth, and I'd been rather agnostic about my beliefs for a long time, simply believing that anything could exist. The older I got, however, the more skeptical I became. But this happened last night, and I can now firmly say that I'm a believer. My friends and I were in a local park last night. We were walking along a trail, and right away, something was off. One of my friends has always experienced the paranormal, and he was extremely uncomfortable. He said he was seeing figures and hearing footsteps throughout the extent of the walk. My other friend and I couldn't see out of the ordinary, so we kind of laughed it off and said that he was just scared, which I now regret doing. It wasn't until we sat down at a tree that things took a turn for the worst. Both of my friends reported feelings of cold dread washing over them that I did not feel. I assumed they just had anxiety. Then my ghost-seeing friend stared at the tree line. I asked him if he was seeing one, and he said yes. I looked into the woods, and I saw it. It was a small, wispy figure that had a white-gray coloration and seemed to be made out of smoke or mist. It was in constant fluid motion, inverting into itself as if it was barely staying visible. It would bend from just a smoke ball to a small humanoid figure. Not childlike, just small, and it would wave. I pointed at it and I asked my friend if it was between the two trees. He said yes. I described what I was seeing, and he said, Oh my gosh, you see it too. We ran out of there after that. I felt the same dread that my other two friends felt and I could not shake the feeling for the rest of the night. It's all I can think about now. I mean, what was that? It didn't feel like a dead person. I mean, it didn't feel like a person at all. It also didn't feel like it was mocking us, more like it was trying to act in a way that was abnormal for it, like it was trying to be human. I don't know. I'm an ex-skeptic that's now begging for answers. My friend and I both saw the same thing, and all three of us felt the same thing. So if you have any idea what that was, I'm all ears. My boyfriend and I went up to his parents' cabin a few years ago. We were the only ones up there for the weekend. We went on a short hike up along a creek known as the Strawberry Trail. We were about a half a mile up just enjoying the beautiful scenery. We embraced in a hug and we both closed our eyes as we did so. But as soon as we did, we heard this loud flapping of wings or running of some large animal. It was so loud that we could feel the vibrations and a sort of wind that came with it. It felt like the animal or thing had stopped right in front of us. I was so terrified I kept my eyes closed, but as soon as I opened them, we both looked around and there was nothing there. We didn't hear it leave, and trust me, we would have. We were spooked, so we booked it back to the cabin. It was around 10 p.m., and my friends and I decided that it was a good idea to play hide-and-seek at 11 p.m. So when we started to play, I ran into the middle of the forest, where I hid. Around a tree, I saw a woman in a white dress, just staring at me. Obviously, I got scared and ran outside of the forest. On the way out, I got a cut that was about three or four inches long on my left hand. I only saw it when I was clear of the woods. When my friends got the balls to do it and go in there, they saw her too. We all ran to the highway, which was about 200 feet away. 
the night passed and we didn't play anymore, but I had a camera at home, which I didn't use anymore. I decided to put a 128 gigabyte SD card in it and place it near the tree that I had hit around to let it record anything. When my friend went to get it, he said that the woman appeared on the camera until 3 a.m. when she suddenly disappeared. Unfortunately, we have since lost the footage, but either way, it was a very scary experience. So when I was like seven or eight, we used to live in Webster, Wisconsin, and we lived in a house a little bit wider and longer than a trailer house. No upstairs, just the base floor and a basement. It was a beautiful house with a big area that was just woods. One day, my cousin was supposed to be watching my two sisters and I, and he said that we could all go play outside as long as we stayed in his sight. But within five minutes, he ran into the woods and told us to keep up. Of course, we listened to him. We ran after him and he disappeared. We couldn't see the house or even the tree line where the woods stopped. We were lost and we started freaking out and crying. Then about a half an hour later, a really tall Native American chief came up behind us and asked us what was wrong and why we were crying. Asked if we were okay, things like that. I told him how we'd been chasing my cousin and we lost him and we don't know how to get back home. He just smiles and says, don't worry, sweetheart. I'll make sure you get home safe and sound. Just come to my village and rest for a little bit. Eat some lunch, play with the children. And when you're ready, you can explain to me where you live. I said, okay. So we go back to his village and it's a smaller one in the middle of the woods in a clearing, but it had at least 60 people. We ate a stew or something like that that they made, and he had me draw in the dirt on the road where our house was. He smiled and said, I know exactly where you live. If you want to play for a little bit, that's okay, but I want to get you home before dark. There are a lot of dangers in these woods, like bears, coyotes, bobcats, not good for children to be out in. So he took us home and he didn't leave the edge of the woods. My mom came out crying, asking where we were, saying she was about to call the cops because we were missing for about four or five hours. She asked us why we left the house without Scotty, my cousin, and I said, he was with us. He ran into the woods and left us behind. We tried to call for him, but he was gone. Then he came outside and said that he had never left the house. He thought we were in our rooms. So I told my mom what happened and she said we would figure it out the next day. The next day we went and followed our footprints and found the village, or what used to be a village. There was almost nothing there. What had been a gorgeous place was now ash. It had all been burned down. The grass, which was shorter the day before, now stood taller than me. It looked like it had just been burned down and left vacant for hundreds of years. We called out for them, but there was no response. We found the chief's headdress and a doll made of deer hide and some other kind of cloth. As we were about to head back, I found a huge eagle feather the size of my arm. It was the most amazing paranormal experience I've ever had. I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail in the northern part of Southern Oregon a few years back with my sister-in-law. It's a 72-mile trail broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Umpqua River and was pretty up and down in the beginning. 
We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable, like somebody was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail, and up. At the top of this very small incline, I could see a small meadow through the trees. Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent. An old canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, Do not, not turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody who wasn't immediately next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to do, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe 10 yards and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor, coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There's thick moss cover under the trees, so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I leaned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did. I did. And so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not to stop until I told her so. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the wind. I just kept telling her, go, go, go. I could see ahead of us that the trail had an incline and then veered to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anybody behind or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles, and we weren't halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother to pick us up. We made it to the next trailhead fairly early, so we made our way out to 138 and started walking east toward home, knowing that he would find us. He did, and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story. He explained that it might be a day or two before they could get on the trail as they had a missing hunter at the time that they were searching for. So a few days go by and he shows up at our house to let me know that we weren't crazy or imagining things and that somebody really did chase us. I asked what they found and who it was. He looked at the floor and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was because if I do, You'll never hike anywhere ever again. What we found was not normal, and it won't happen up here again. He then instructed me to never, ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found, or who it was. I never hiked that section of trail again, and it completely burned last year. I also never hike unarmed, ever. That was huge for me because I wasn't really a gun person at the time. But I am a living person and I'd like to stay that way, so I took his advice. I had many incidents living up there in the national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing ever scared me as much as another human did that day. In Sydney, there's this National Park Drive where people complete runs which consist of trying to complete the drives within a timestamp. I've been doing these so-called Nasho runs for a while now with my best friend. Nothing has ever happened before, and the drive through the park is spooky at night, sure, but I've always found comfort in the woodlands or in night drives, so I never really thought anything of it. A few nights ago, 
three of my friends and I went for a Nasho run, and exactly at the halfway point, we hit a pothole pretty hard, which resulted in a flat tire, so we pulled over to the side on a long road. This place has no reception, and it's in the middle of nowhere, with no way of walking through or back. We had a spare tire, but no change kit, so I had one friend on call for help, which was a pain due to the lack of reception. My best friend panics a lot, so she was on the verge of crying, and I was rummaging through the boot for a wrench and a jack. About 20 meters away was a parked car, which was strange because the last house we passed was about a kilometer away, but we just shrugged it off. Later on in the dead of night, we hear a group of friends laughing, and this spooked my friends, so they stayed in the car. I told them I was going to follow the laughter and ask if they had a change kit in their parked car. Nate insisted on coming with me. We walked 20 meters to the parked car and nobody was in there. It gets pretty freaking dark, so I tell him to turn on his flashlight, which he does. We turn a corner on a gravel road and once we do, we see a woman standing there with her back toward us. The group laughter had stopped, which left us in the dead of night, in complete silence, in the middle of nowhere, with this random woman who was just standing there. But she looked pretty normal to me, so I approached her slowly. I said, hey. She didn't turn around or react at all. So I stopped in my tracks, but Nate continued walking toward her. He stopped about five meters away behind her. I yelled out, Oi! And again, she didn't turn around. We weren't able to see her face, but something just wasn't right. She was tall, in all white. But I looked at Nate and he just stood there, and under his breath, he muttered my name and told me to go repeatedly. So I turned around and started walking back. By the time we passed the car, we started running back to our car. We sat inside and I asked what happened and he said that something was wrong because a woman just shouldn't be standing there by herself in pitch darkness in the middle of a gravel road. In addition to that, she didn't react to us or our source of light. He said he just felt ominous about it all. We told our other two friends and Nate was very shaken up. They sort of laughed it off. And when we ended up finally changing the tire, we turned the car back around and stopped right where we had seen the woman. I rolled the window down and shined my flashlight on the gravel road. The woman was gone though. No more laughter, just silence. I thought maybe I had imagined her, but we stood right there and Nate was right behind her. However, every single one of us heard the group laughter, and there's a fair share of paranormal stories about this area. But up until then, I'd never really paid attention to it. I know it doesn't sound like much, but at the time, it was so crazy. Something just felt so, so wrong. And the way the laughter got relatively loud the closer we got, but then came to a total halt once we saw her, something was just wrong. It was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. A person with zero hiking, camping, or other experience had gotten themselves into trouble big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree and the desperate looking human figure covered in blood, whimpering quietly. I put my bag down, grabbed my kit, and went over to the person. They looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to the hip, single punctures up and down his back, and hands and forearms full of what looked to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map, and hightailed it to the closest road. This was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. 
Thankfully, the road was very close by, less than two miles, and I was able to flag somebody down. They took off and I waited for assistance to arrive. It took about an hour until rescue got there. I led them to the still unidentified individual. He wasn't very conversive when I first found him. I was sure he'd be dead before we got there, but I was wrong. I assisted rescue bringing him out and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call to let me know what was up with the person that we had helped. I got home three days later, and there was a message on my machine. Story goes that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent, and not high enough. The night before I happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent, and its occupant, in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. The guy survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods again. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under the canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, riverbank, lake shore, ridge bottoms, bogs and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important that you understand that I have heard, seen, and smelled about all this region has to offer in the way of wilderness. My scariest experience, though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I heard a loud crack, and I froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing dead quiet. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there, balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around and going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall, it wasn't a widowmaker. I was sure that I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice? Well, that meant to get out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent-sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo bat-sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump. I've described it in the past as explosive because it was so terribly loud and sudden. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound had come from, and I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come across a 180-degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant that as soon as I got the courage to move toward the noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head is somewhere between there's a murderer and there's Bigfoot, and I really didn't know which. Minutes pass. I just breathe the foggy breath and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. 
I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light, so I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep toward that turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. That didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen, and then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking, fast. By the time I made the top of the ridge, I was huffing and puffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out and the birds were chirping. I have heard it all in the woods. I've smelled it all. I'm telling you, I don't know what that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard that many times. This wasn't that. But what it was? I don't know. This happened when I was in middle school. I'm about to graduate high school. I still remember every detail to this day. When I was younger, my mother sent my siblings and I to this cute little summer camp in the mountains. It was one week in the middle of nowhere. No cell service, no quick way to reach anybody, and we were miles and miles from the nearest town. This event happened in my third year of attendance. The way these campsites were set up goes as follows. You were split up by gender and age group. Each campsite had four cabins with five raised beds in each and one lean-to for the assigned camp counselor. So in your cabin, you've got four buddies that you get to know fairly well throughout the week. There's also no bathrooms at the campsites. So if you had to go, you would have to get the TP from your counselor and go into the woods. We were about 12 at the time, so we always had to go with a buddy. This one night, a girl in my cabin, who I had become pretty close with throughout the week, was just talking to me in the dark of our cabin about absolutely nothing. Just two kids who couldn't sleep so we opted to stay up and talk until we could sleep. Eventually, she tells me she has to go to the bathroom and asks if I'll go with her. I say, yeah, no biggie. So we grab our flashlights and sandals and hike over to get some TP, and then we go back past our cabin. Ours was the farthest out, on the edge of our campsite, a good 20 feet from the other cabins, and we go a little ways into the woods. I stand on the path while she goes up into the trees to do her business. Again, we're 12. It's cold, and we're both afraid of the dark. So she asks me to keep talking to her so she doesn't freak herself out. So we're talking about nothing, and I'm doing that little step dance you do when you're cold, swishing my flashlight around to see if I'd find anything cool. I almost never go to the mountains, and I just wanted to know if there'd be any cool plants or animals that I could see in the distance. I stop as my light lands about 13 feet away from me. I was dead in my tracks. To this day, I don't know what else to describe this thing as other than the description of the rake from that creepypasta story. I know how childish that sounds, but it's the only comparison I had in my head. It looked freakishly lanky, extremely decrepit, pale, hairless, like a person, but definitely not a person. I could only see its head, shoulders, and from its forearms to its fingers, it stretched out as if it was crawling down the path. It had long, spindly fingers that seemed to sharpen at the end. I really don't know if I was looking at nails and claws or if its skin was just stretched like that. 
Its head was pointed slightly downward, and I would later figure that it was as if it was trying to avoid the light beam, but I could still see its eyes. Eyes that still make me shiver if I think about it too long. Large, black ones. I don't know if it was extremely dilated pupils, or if its eyes were just black, but it was like the eyes themselves bulged out of its head. I was too scared to shine my light any farther, and I could see one of its hands slowly creeping toward me. I was petrified in my spot. I didn't move my light off of it once I saw it. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't going to just leave this girl out there if it actually was something that might have hurt her. I told her to hurry up. She asked me why my voice was shaking. I remember saying, I, I don't want you to freak out. It's probably nothing. I I'll tell you when we get back. But uh, w when you're done, just tell me. Because we're going to make a run for the cabin. Okay? That really made her move. I felt bad for scaring her, but I myself was terrified. I heard her say, done, and I just told her to run. I spun around, finally taking my light off of it, and sprinted so quickly that I caught up to her in seconds. This might have been my own heartbeat pulsing in my ears, but I was sure I could hear it almost galloping behind me. We were both moving so quickly that we slipped a bit on the leaves in front of our cabin door. I remember two of the other girls waking up when the door slammed behind us as I fumbled with the hook that would lock it. I don't really know how I thought that would help though. It was a poor lock. My friend was freaking out, asking me what I saw and practically begging me to tell her I was pranking her. I couldn't say anything though as I had begun to have one of the worst panic attacks in my life. My breathing became audibly labored and someone had to get up to get our camp counselor, which is what got me talking again. She got about halfway to the door before I said, no, and that was what made everyone more freaked out. Eventually our counselor heard us and came to the cabin. Someone opened the door for her and she came in wanting to know why I was crying so viciously and why everyone was panicked. I was able to piece together a coherent enough sentence that she got the gist. Obviously, she didn't believe me, who would, but she finally gave up on trying to convince me when she offered to go with me to confirm there was nothing there, and I just kept crying harder at the thought. I slept in the lean-to with her for the rest of the week. I'll be the first to admit that I can't honestly know what I saw. I was 12, it was dark, and I was tired, with probably an overactive imagination. But I know that staring off into the dark has never struck such terror into me like that before. I know that figure that I saw, I just don't know what to call it. I still don't really know what to make of it, but I think about it every summer. This is an experience I had a few years ago, which made me a believer in the paranormal. I hope you find it as interesting and creepy as I did. I went out very early in the morning, about 5 a.m., to take photos in the forest. I've always liked the vibe of the forest, especially during early mornings, since it has a kind of calmness to it. I live in central Sweden, where we have many deep forests everywhere. Much of it is untouched. Think plenty of moss and old growth trees. This particular forest I went to was quite near my home. However, since I lived in the countryside, I was very alone with no other soul around. During this morning, there was also fog lingering in the treetops from the surrounding rivers which looked really cool to be honest, so I was very ready to go take some awesome photos. I went into the forest after parking my car along the road that went beside it, 
and I started walking straight in. After maybe a hundred meters, I stopped to take some photos, mostly of dead trees and mushrooms and things like that. I was 20 and I felt very artsy. After a few minutes, I started hearing knocks on the trees. Probably a bird, I thought, since we do have woodpeckers around here. So I didn't think that the sound was too unusual. The strange thing is that I started looking for it since it came from a tree that was right beside me, but I couldn't find it. Unlucky, I thought. I wanted to see if I could get a nice photo of the bird, but I decided to move on. I continued walking into the forest when I noticed something. The knocking or pecking seemed to follow me as I walked. It continuously knocked on the trees closest to me. At this point, I still didn't think too much about it, but that would change after a while. I stopped at a spot that looked really nice to set up my camera on a tripod in an attempt to maybe snap some cool photos of the surrounding area and treetops. I sat down and continued to hear this knocking on a tree just a few meters behind me. At this point, I started to feel a little weird about it since I had started to notice how it followed me. A few seconds later, while changing my camera settings, I suddenly heard several very loud and very clear heavy footsteps behind me that rapidly approached until they were right behind me. My whole body froze. I have not until this day experienced chills like that through my whole entire body. After what felt like several seconds, I flew up and spun around to what I thought was going to be some kind of a big animal but nothing was there. For context, besides a few trees, this area was not particularly dense. Just a few trees here and there, but mostly moss and grass, like a clearing. I picked up all my things and started walking quickly back toward my car. And that's when the knocking started again. It followed me again, and I just knew that something was mocking me. Feeling a little silly, I said, I'm leaving, okay? I knew that whatever it was didn't want me there. I continued to hear the knocking until I came back to the spot where I first started hearing it. And then it just stopped. I, on the other hand, did not. I went straight back to my car and I went home. Before this, I was pretty skeptical about the paranormal but this really changed my views. Since then, I've only had one other experience that I consider paranormal, but this is the one that scared me the most. The Lost Child Calling for Help Here's a story that I still can't fully wrap my head around. It happened a few years ago, when I was hiking in a pretty remote area. It's known for its dense forests and winding trails, but it's not usually too busy, so it's a great spot for some solitude. So I'm out on this hike, enjoying the peace and quiet, when I hear something strange. It's a child's voice calling out for help. The voice sounds distant and muffled, like it's coming from deep in the woods. At first, I thought maybe my mind was playing tricks on me, but I hear it again, even clearer this time. A desperate, help me, please. My first instinct was to find whoever was calling out. I mean, a kid lost in these woods would be in real trouble. I started searching, moving off the trail, calling out to the voice. It's weird though. Every time I thought I was getting closer, the voice seemed to move farther away, like it was purposefully walking away from me, or more like it was leading me 
deeper and deeper into the forest. After about an hour of this, I'm really deep in there and I start to get this very uneasy feeling. The voice keeps calling out, but I'm no closer to finding anyone. It's starting to get dark and I know I need to head back. But I'm torn because what if there really is a kid out here? I finally decide to make my way back to the trail, planning to get help. But as I'm leaving, right behind me in my ear as clear as day, I hear, help me, please. I spin around and there's nobody, just the trees and the fading light. Wasn't so worried about that kid anymore. I booked it back to the trail and out of the woods. I told the park rangers about it just in case, and they did a search, but they never found any signs of a child or anyone else out there. Later, I learned from some locals that there are legends about those woods, stories of mimics, spirits, voices that lure people off the path. They say it's the woods playing tricks on you or something more supernatural. I don't really know what to believe. But hearing that lost child calling for help, leading me deeper, being far away and then suddenly right in my ear only to vanish, it was one of the most unnerving experiences I have ever had. It always reminds me, sometimes the wilderness holds more mysteries than we're ready to face. A year ago, while living in New Jersey, I currently live in Michigan, I came across a strange news story about a young hiker discovered dead in a mountainous forest. It initially seemed a routine incident, but the circumstances soon proved to be strange. The report indicated that the mountain was undergoing a period of heavy rainfall during that time. The downpour was relentless, sometimes exceeding half an inch per hour and it continued for several days before and during the search for the man. An autopsy conducted by a medical examiner revealed intriguing findings. Aside from a few scratches on his knees, the man displayed no visible injuries or signs of infection. However, the condition of his lungs and airways was alarming. The autopsy report emphasized the remarkable presence of pus in his tracheal bronchial tree. The man was only 28 years old. What's even stranger is that the coroner suggested the rainfall might have contributed to his condition. By the time the hiker was found, he had been dead for three days, and there was no record of him issuing any distress calls. It also hinted that hypothermia was not the cause of death. After this report, there were no subsequent updates about the man's case. It was a startling silence for such an unusual incident. A man found lifeless on a mountain, his lungs and airways filled with an abnormal amount of fluid. Sometimes I still wonder about what really happened to him. Singing in the Woods by S. H. Mazran, posted to r slash backwoods creepy. I've been getting more acclimated to camping as a solo female. I'm pretty comfortable in the woods for the most part. I feel safe and at home. This was my first time solo camping in the area I'm from, so it felt particularly special. It was a pretty rugged, remote part of WNC camped off a gravel road right by the creek. After having dinner by the fire, I settled into my tent, the air of early spring growing colder. As I'm trying to get cozy and drift off, I hear what I can only describe as a woman singing. 
I'm pretty skeptical, and I know our ears can play tricks on us. I've definitely heard things before, when there was a monotonous sound like the river, so I tried to brush it off. But it had range, it wasn't at all consistent, and it was as if there was a tune to it. At this point, I froze, holding my breath. The singing sound would stop, and then start again. I was terrified, honestly. Eventually, I had to suck it up and go outside to pee. The moon was full so I could see. Nothing there at all. Just the beautiful creek in the night. I continued to hear it for a little while longer, before a very poor sleep. That's all, nothing too crazy. But I just know what I heard, and I don't have any explanation. Someone or something answered my son. By user OKNobody3068, posted to r slash Backwoods Creepy. This happened Easter of last year. My husband's family owns an old farm with a large property with mountains, a lake, and the woods. No one lives on the farm anymore, so we use it as a holiday residence. This is in West Norway. So fjords and mountains and lots of red deer all over the place. No neighbors and no animals except wild ones. There are old ruins from the Viking Age, about 500 meters from the house, nearby the lake. Much unknown history, and I find the forest very eerie. I'm Norwegian, and my ex, the father of my kids, is Canadian. He is not so much around anymore, and my daughter, who's 10 years old, is very fond of horror movies. My son, who's 9 years old, also likes a good scare. To help them not forget their Canadian culture, I told them about the Wendigo. This was in the car on our way to the west for the Easter holiday, since there's so many deer out there. I told them a story that I have read, about Wendigo mimicking kitten sounds, and I told them that these Norwegian mountains are the same as the Appalachians before the continents split up, and maybe that's why they can be so eerie. The second day there, we cut down some small trees outside the house. The kids and I dragged the branches over a small field and tossed them down a hill. This hill is where the forest begins, and it's also the path down to the lake. My husband at the time was in the garage, fixing the chainsaw. This is in the complete opposite direction. As we took a break by the tree line, my son, with my Wendigo story in mind, starts to make a special cartoonish cat meow that he thinks is funny into the forest. He kept going about six to nine times before I finally told him to knock it off and get back to helping us with the branches. We turned around and there was a very clear meow coming from the bottom of the hill. It sounded exactly like my son's meowing and it wasn't my son. He stood right beside me and it was his voice and his characteristic mirror, mirror. We shrugged it off as someone hiking, answering the meowing, and I didn't want to scare the kids for real, and didn't remind them that it was private land, and that nobody except us goes down there. The only walkable path is through our garden and small field. We got up to the garage and told my husband, and went inside for lunch. He was just like, well, lots of spirits in these woods, I guess and we didn't talk about it again. He's a man of few words and not easily scared. He grew up on the farm every vacation. He knows the land well, and he thinks it's mystical but not scary. My husband reminded me of the meowing in the car on our way there this Easter. We still can't figure out a rational explanation for that either. 
So we just landed on the forest spirits, or a really demented strange fox. For now, I'm just going to assume there was a raven. But I've heard raven mimic things like that, and this didn't sound like that at all. It literally sounded like somebody had recorded my son and played it back. I live in the mountains and my hollow is surrounded by woods. There's a little spot you can walk into in the woods, which is just a giant circle with trees open all around it. My friend and I have gone to picnic there. And this day that we went there, we started hearing this flute. It was really loud and it was coming from a direction where there were no houses. It sounded like a woodwind of sort, something that sounded very spiritual. All of my neighbors were pretty old, and I can guarantee that none of them spend their time walking in the woods playing a flute. We heard this for hours. We left at about 8 o'clock that night, and when we walked back, you could hear it somewhat across the valley. I didn't hear it again for about two years after that, but one night I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. My bed was right next to the window, and I had cracked it to let in some fresh air while I slept. I woke up to the sound of the flute, coming right outside my window. I was too worried to look out and see what it was. It went on for about an hour, before it finally stopped playing. And to this day, I have never heard it again. I feel creeped out even typing this story. I'm staying at my friend's house in Tennessee over winter break, and tonight I helped her feed the neighbor's dogs because they were out of town. Her house is in a somewhat rural area. There are clusters of homes kind of spread across fields, forests, and lake areas, all very beautiful and full of lots of wildlife. It's about 9 p.m. and it's way past sunset. It's quite dark and we're walking the short distance from the neighbor's house back to hers. We are on a road, but directly next to us is a small wooded area sloping down to the lake. I'm a little nervous about it, so I make a joke like, that forest is kind of creeping me out. Imagine if there's a skinwalker out there. She laughed and gobbled like a turkey loudly into the forest. Jokingly, I said, don't do that, it'll attract one. Not five seconds later, we hear an identical gobble back to us from the forest. It was definitely not an echo. There was no light out there, no paths, and it was very cold, like 30 degrees. I can't imagine anybody would just be hanging out in the woods on the off chance they could mock somebody. What's weirder is that it sounded like her. It sounded as though somebody had recorded her voice and played it back. I just remember saying, oh my God, and then sprinting as fast as I could back to the house. I don't think I've ever run so fast or with so much intention in all my life. I didn't turn back and I was so out of breath it hurt. My friend thought the whole thing was funny, but I didn't. It was so freaky. Did we see or encounter a skinwalker? Or was it something else? My parents got divorced when I was 12, and my mom moved us into a small town in the Pennsylvania mountains. 
After a few months of living there, I went back to live with my dad in Texas. Ever since, though, I have heard the voices of people I know calling me into the woods. It's been almost eight years now. It's only when I'm alone, but every time I'm alone, and it seems to only happen in Texas. It's weird, but I never even considered that this was maybe something to be concerned about until recently. It was just something that happened. It was almost normal. I even followed the voice once and only thought it was kind of weird that I had heard my dad screaming at me when he hadn't actually called me at all because I got home later and I asked him about it. I don't know if this is related or not, but remembering this is what inspired me to tell this story. A few years ago, I was about a mile out into the woods in Pennsylvania when I kind of zoned out for a minute. I zoned back in and I heard a stick snap. I looked over to see a white tailed doe staring at me from about 10 feet away. It looked almost as though it had been trying to sneak closer to me when I looked at it. I just kind of backed away from it and went back down the mountain. If you're familiar with deer at all, you know this is very strange behavior. Usually, the deer are the ones that run. At the very least, they freeze, but they certainly don't try to sneak up on you. I'm not entirely sure what to make of this now, but looking back on all the times that I just sort of brushed off as normal, I'm starting to think maybe there was nothing normal about it. 